Okay, good evening. <laughs> Noting the hour and the presence of a quorum, I call the Acton-Boxborough Regional School Committee to order. Uh, we are in person tonight, and members of the public who wish to view this meeting uh, can either be in public with us or do so on Acton TV's YouTube channel that is found at the top of the agenda. This meeting is being recorded, and it will be posted on Acton TV's website. So welcome, everybody. As a point of reference, there are only four regularly scheduled school committee meetings left for this school year. I mention this because there is a lot for this committee to complete in the next four meetings. But before we move forward to our business, we need to stop and say thanks to two members for whom this will be their last meeting. Nora Shine and John Peterson will be stepping down following the next town election and annual town meeting. And I wanted to stop and thank John and Nora for their service to the committee. First to John, I'll miss sparring with you. You've changed the way I think on many topics, red turnbacks, and I greatly appreciate that you don't take yourself too seriously. I think Kira has some more appreciation for you as well. Yeah, I got the homework, so I'm going to read this. All right, here we go. So, small town volunteer service is a choice. This is sacrificial time lovingly given to our community to make it better. The sincere hope for anyone who chooses to sit in these chairs, come to these meetings and do this work, is that we leave the community a little better than how we found it, and that we'll put down the work satisfied. John Peterson chose to pick up this work twice, once for a term starting in 2008, and then after a short break, again starting in 2019. In his service, John took on many of the unglamorous but important posts that help assure good stewardship of our school district, including sitting on HIT, capital improvement, and warrant signing subcommittees. I'll leave it to others to talk about some of his other roles. I have said it in the past few meetings, and I will say it again. The town of Acton owes John Peterson its thanks for the time he has given, the care he has shown, and the expertise he has applied to his service as a member of this committee. Serving alongside him at ALG this year, I've seen how all of that has worked in action and what a difference it has made for our work and our collaboration with the town. I have not always agreed with John, and I have not always enjoyed his belaboring of his points. But I have come to appreciate how his well-placed questions can move the needle on something big, how his firm stances have reminded us of our duties and the nature of our relationship with our colleagues in administration and how being consistent while good humor can cut tension and push us forward. We are losing something today. Yet I take heart in knowing how much we've gained by your presence here. As we look ahead to the pivotal work next school year, I hope we will each channel at least one of your lessons. Studious attention to the work, steadfast commitment to our duties, and perhaps, most importantly, a touch of humor, even in the face of challenge. I wish you the best of luck in your next chapter, John. Thank you, Kara. She did, she did, she did. She said. Go ahead, Tessa. Okay, John. So you wanted a poem, so I found one today during my break. <laughs> it's not reflective of you, actually, because as um, Kira noted, you tend to be a little long-winded. Um, but th <laughs> this poem is all but five words. People don't change, opinions do. And um, I have seen you change in the three years I have worked alongside you, many of your opinions about many things. And 
while I will not say that I have changed many of mine <laughs> alongside you, I certainly agree with Kira in that um, I think that you are thoughtful. I think you are everything that a school committee member should be. I think you pay attention sometimes to the wrong things, but often to the right things. And that I think that that's an incredibly important quality. And I think that there are lots of things that I could care less about, like the health insurance trust, but you care greatly about it. And I think that that's the important balance of having a committee of 11 people, that we get to have somebody who cares about turnbacks and the health insurance trust and all the things that do not keep me up at night. But they do keep you up at night, and I think that that is a really important thing. And so working with you over these past three years, I think, really has highlighted for me the importance of having different opinions and different styles and different ways of doing things on the committee. And even though I have given you an incredibly hard time, especially during the two years that I was chair, I really do appreciate the work that you've done, and I really have enjoyed working on the committee with you. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have comments for John? John, I think it's a fitting time for you to share your thoughts with the committee. Well, Adam told me in advance, he said no more than 30 minutes. No, I think you added a zero to that. <laughs> um, but because Tessa started with a poem, I'm going to, of course, immediately depart from my prepared remarks to share with you Richard Brodigan's famous poem, the titular poem from the Spring Hill versus the Mine Disaster. And the entire poem consists of, when you take your pill, it's like a mine disaster. I think of all the people lost inside you. So you can let that resonate against the events of the day. And <laughs> we'll go on. As Adam said, the agenda notes the retirement of Nora and myself with tonight's school committee meeting. While it is true that this is our last school committee meeting, Nora and I will continue to serve through our town meetings over the next two weeks. Besides this technical point, service to the school committee and the district need neither begin with the start of a member's term nor end at its conclusion. In the transition, I look forward to working with the new school, com member school committee members serving on the Health Insurance Trust and supporting new Steve Noon as he becomes the HIT chair. I thank all of you for your service and the opportunity to serve with you, and in particular to Adam and Tessa for their indulgences while chairing our many meetings. Um, reflections on transitional events may look backward. My objective is to focus on the future. Every school committee member is a caretaker of our community resources and the futures of our students. We recognize that others have served as caretakers to pave our way and that we in turn will hand those responsibilities to new members. Tonight I make explicit the work that I have tried to do over the past three years so that to the extent it has merit, it will continue. As my children progress through AB, I told them they will never speak or write too well. In our meetings, I have tried to keep this dedication to improved communication at top of mind. I hope you will work to improve communication. As our family embarked on our scouting journey, we were reminded to be prepared. I hope my preparation for meetings has been visible and served as an example, not only for my fellow members, but also for staff, students, and members of the community. To the extent that I have been able to dig deeply into some issues, this was not the result of magic. It was simply working to be prepared. I hope you will work to be well prepared. You have heard me remark, no one is perfect. And I think I've heard some of you recognize that I represent a working example. Mistakes will be made. Recognizing and acknowledge them should be like breathing. It is at the core of what we ask our students to do every day. I hope that you will recognize and acknowledge our mistakes and, like our students, use them to form a base for continuous improvement. Finally, there will always be a tension between our desire to achieve and the limitations of our achievements. Each of us will need to find a personal balance between our interests and the abilities and resources that we have to pursue them. Personally, I have never resolved this conflict with great certainty and, in fact, think that the resolution is found in the form of accepted ambiguity and ambivalence. The thought that I could be wrong is at the center of the ability to change and to find a better path. I hope you will embrace ambiguity and ambivalence as you search for better educational experiences for our students and endeavor to build an even more vibrant and fulfilling community. Thank you. Thank you, John. Nora, you joined the committee just one year after I did. 
Yet you hit the ground running and you brought a unique and valuable perspective to our work. The time you spent on policy committee helped to drive the direction of the district, and we were lucky to have you help raise awareness of the advertising practices of some of our software platforms that our students interact with. I feel so grateful for the conversations we had about your leadership of the policy subcommittee this year. You were never afraid to ask for guidance or help, but in reality, you already knew what was best. You're also a great sounding board. You're level-headed, yet passionate. You've been a great sounding board for me and challenged me to be better. Thank you for your contribution to our district and for your friendship. Thank you. Anybody else have comments for Nora? Thanks, Nora. Thank you. We have, yeah, go ahead, Peter. I just want to very briefly just thank both of you. Uh, you know, in very different ways, you each have offered a lot of different guidance over the course of your term. Um, I appreciate that, and you have also helped me to think in new and deeper ways about what the work we're doing, ways to carry that forward, and ways to be stewards for the schools in, in service of our children. So thank you both. I really appreciate it. You know, John, you have an uncanny way of thinking about the question that's going to provoke a lot of deep thought, and I will always appreciate that about you. And Nora, you just have this passion for thinking about children as a whole um, and really making us think deeply about all of kids' needs and, you know, helping to be stewards for that. So thank you. Thanks, Peter. I've presented both John and Nora with cards of thanks from the committee. Nora is also receiving an Acton Boxborough chair, which will help shove into your car. John, as much as you would like to build a dining room set of Acton Boxborough chairs, I've, I've learned that you only get one, no matter how many times you choose to serve on the committee. So we have a, a nice gift for you as well, though. Thank you. Um, we do not have our student representatives with us this evening, so we'll have them at our next meeting. And next, we're moving on to public participation. So as per policy BEDH, members of the public are invited to speak for up to three minutes regarding items that are not already on the agenda. For items that are on the agenda, the public is asked to wait for them. The committee does not typically respond to comments made during public participation. Again, I'll ask our speakers to be respectful and civil. The Institute for Local Government defines civility this way. In the context of democratic debate, civility is about how people treat each other. Civility involves the display of respect for those who have positions with which one disagrees. Even though disagreement plays a necessary role in governance and in politics, the issue is how one expresses that disagreement. The key is to focus on the strengths and weaknesses of the proposed solutions to the community's problem, not to engage in personal attacks against those who favor different solutions. An even more powerful strategy is to listen for the concerns and the values that underline people's diverse perspectives to try to identify points of agreement and common ground. And with that, I will open the floor for public comment. There we go. Thank you. Scott Smyers, 382 Central Street. Thank you, John. Thank you, Nora, for your service on the school committee. I got to know John a few years ago when our sons were in Scouts together, and he was, he was a very nice man, and he was very helpful to my family. Um, but I'm here tonight to follow up on some emails I've been uh, exchanging with Superintendent Light, specific to uh, three topics. One is discrimination, and that is the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1963 or 64 prohibits discrimination in hiring in any policies. I've been asking him some questions about that. He's been uh, answering them as best, he's can, as best he can. But it seems like the more I look into this, based on the information you've provided, the anti-bias training that your staff is going through and you're implementing in your hiring practices seems to be a way to just have a new kind of bias. And I'm concerned about that when you're hiring when you're asking questions of candidates. You know, we want good quality candidates. We don't want to discriminate based on race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. We want the best quality candidates we can have. And what you've been saying over and over again is that you're going to look to discriminate towards certain ethnicities and uh, other uh, uh, sexual orientation 
candidates, and that is not necessarily a good thing and could get you in a lot of trouble in the future. So I would appreciate if you reconsider that perspective, what is anti-bias training really just a way to bias yourself the other way? And think about that hard before you implement that uh, throughout the entire school district and your uh, policies. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Hi, good evening, Martin Benson, 21 Deacon Hunt Drive. Uh, first, I would like to thank Mr. Peterson for his service to the school district. Your wealth of knowledge, experience, and insightfulness will be missed on this board. Second, thank you to Mr. Klein for reaching out to Mr. Cadillac and empathizing with the real hurt he felt given his life experience over the Nazi contingent comment which appeared on Facebook. It's unfortunate that there weren't additional communication to Mr. Cadillac from other board members. Third, with respect to the text messages by committee members during school committee meetings of October 15th, 2020 and December 17th, 2020, the administration and school committee continues to engage in dilatory tactics and refuses to comply with the public records law. The school committee acknowledged in an open meeting law complaint that there were text communications between Tessa McKinley and Kara Wilson Cook during the October 15th, 2020 meeting. Yet these text messages and hundreds of others have not been produced. We will continue to pursue this matter through the Office of Secretary of State and if necessary, through litigation in the Superior Court. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Madeline and I live in two townhouse lane um, over at Yankee Village. Um, I wanna start off by saying thank you to all our educators as it is Teacher Appreciation Week. Equity, diversity, and inclusion are inevitable changes happening all over our world today. Continuing to push for a past mascot that does not equally represent all of us is indignifying and quite frankly, an embarrassment. Some of you claims people um, against the colonial mascot live in a bubble. Wow, what an irrational, ignorant thought. We, no, we do not live in a bubble. We live in reality. Please stop I'm spreading. Sorry. I'm sorry, the comments about the mascot, we wanna wait until the mascot portion of the, the meeting. Oh, I didn't see that on the agenda, I'm so sorry. So I guess I'll come back up then. Please, thank, thank you. Thank you. Hi, David. Hello, I'm David Martin. I live on High Street in Acton. At your last meeting, one of the people in the group against the mascot change made, made an accusation against me and the superintendent. I just wanted to say that the accusation is false in several respects. I won't go into details, but I wanted to say that the school committee should have full confidence in the superintendent. He's managed the mascot change process very well under very trying circumstances. Although I don't agree with the harassment that the superintendent and the school committee have faced in the past year and a half, I completely understand that some people are disappointed in the mascot change and I respect their right to say so. I especially uh, respect the students that I've heard who've commented how they feel negatively affected by the change in mascot. It took courage to speak out. I'd like to thank the school committee for their commitment to our schools in the face of harassment. Thanks, David. Hi, good evening. I'm Steve Ballard I'm from uh, Boxborough. Just give me a, sorry, one second, Steve. Thank sure, you. no problem. Um, it, Peter pointed out, and, I, and I, I just don't want to remind anybody who's here to speak, the, the mascot is an item on our agenda um, as soon as we get through our new business and presentations from our principals. So if anybody, again, wants to talk to anything about the mascot, happy to have that public participation at the right time during the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yes, I'm here for that, but I've I got two other points I just thought of making. Thank you, John, and thank you, Nora, for your service. Um, I'm sure you'll be glad not to have to hear from me anymore. And um, I was glad to get that email today uh, about the, the DEI person that's been hired, Jennifer Faber, and just wanted to note that, see, see that she's from the Wilderness School in, in Weston, and I just went on their site and I, I looked at the kindergarten registration and I didn't see anything about tuition, just to, just to note that. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Hi. My name is Kim Mazzioli, um, and I live on Great Road, and I grew up in Acton. I've lived here my whole life. I actually put my kids through school here, and I came back here 
because when I graduated, we had gotten that flag of excellence. And we had been like 10, number 10. And now, I, you know, my kids are both out of school, but I love the town. And you know, like I said, it, I've grown up here. And I think that there's, what's, what's going on is creating more division than it is unity. And I don't know why the message isn't that we don't pick on anybody. Not that we don't pick on a specific race or a specific gender or somebody who chooses to identify as something else. And, and the rest of it isn't just reading, writing, arithmetic, and all that. But it, it, to me, it's wrong for anybody to pick on anybody. And I don't think that the you know, equity and, and, and all the things, I think it sends a, a, lot, a wrong message to a lot of people. And, and now you're singling these people out, and singling these people out, and I think the message should just be acceptance. Thank you. Any other members of the public wish to comment at this time? Okay, thank you. Moving on to the superintendent's update, Peter. Thank you, Adam. So, you know, a few different things. I want to start off by also echoing some earlier comments we heard that this is Teacher Appreciation Week. So I want to extend my gratitude to all of our staff and for their continued efforts on behalf of our students. Um, this has been a challenging year for everyone, students, families, and staff included. I'm constantly impressed by the efforts of our educators and teachers and support staff to make on behalf of our kids. I would encourage our families to maybe take an opportunity this week to just send a note of gratitude uh, to one of the chi their child's teachers. Um, I think those notes as they're received by staff, from everyone I hear from is by far the best gift that can be given is just thank you, I love what you're doing for my kid, and I really appreciate your time and energy. So I think I would just encourage people to think about taking a moment to do that. I also want to note, um, and we sent out the announcement earlier, but uh, we have appointed Jennifer Faber um, as the new Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the district. Um, I'll just read a little bit about Jen. Um, Jennifer is a longtime Massachusetts public school educator, currently in her seventh year as the principal at the Woodland School in Weston. She's consistently worked toward creating a learning environment using a holistic approach toward educating students. Using her native language of Spanish, she previously served as the assistant principal at the Barbary School, a two-way bilingual elementary school in Framingham. Prior to her three years at the Barbary School, she was a classroom teacher in both the Sudbury and Lexington public school systems. Additionally, she is one of 20 administrators in Massachusetts selected to participate in the Influence 100 program, a two-year fellowship focused on equity and inclusion. Jennifer matriculated from Barry University in Miami Shores, Florida with an undergraduate degree in elementary education and received her master's degree from Lesley University in special education and literacy. Raised in Miami Beach, Jennifer relocated to Massachusetts with her husband in 1998 and has been actively involved in a number of charitable efforts benefiting children and young adults, including her current role as the co-chair of the Boston Children's Museum President's Council. She and her husband have raised their two daughters, Isabella, 20, and Alexa, 18, in Sudbury, Mass., where Jennifer has found a great work-life balance with travel being an activity of choice. So we are looking forward to welcoming Jennifer, and at some point in the future, we will invite her to a school committee meeting so you have an opportunity to meet her. Uh, COVID cases, I do wanna just give a quick COVID case update. Um, if you've been following our COVID numbers uh, over the last two weeks, uh, you have seen that we are in the middle of a push in cases um, and have seen quite a few cases of COVID in our schools. Based on a conference call with the DESE commissioner that we had today, um, this is pretty consistent with what the state is seeing um, and districts everywhere are seeing. Um, during the call, we also heard some information though that epidemiologists are actually hopeful that this week was the peak and we're gonna see a decline in case numbers over the next couple of weeks. Um, we wanna draw families' attention to that increase in cases. We understand that many families uh, may choose to wear masks indoors for some period of time. We have no uh, reports of any adverse consequences from the cases in our schools, with many staff and students reporting mild symptoms. 
We have no plans to modify existing protocols at this time other than to make families aware of the increase in cases, but we continue to also monitor those cases in conjunction with our health advisory team. So we're watching things. You know, we certainly continue to talk about that with our health advisory team. Right now, we're not intending to modify protocols, um, but we just want to make sure families know so that people can make good choices for themselves. Uh, Miriam principal search, um, that search is underway. Um, as you're aware, Juliana Schneider has announced that she's accepted a position in a district much closer to her home. Um, I want to congratulate her on that. We currently have an interview team composed of various stakeholders, including staff and families, um, and some of our administrators. And we are awaiting results from the initial round of interviews, which actually concluded yesterday. So we're keeping that process moving. Early college update. Uh, we've been in discussions with Middlesex Community College in pursuit of a partnership that will allow us to offer concurrent enrollment courses at ABRHS beginning next fall. Discussions are proceeding and we're planning to pilot one course next fall and hope to expand the program over the next several years. Our goal is to allow our students at ABRHS to earn college level credits while completing coursework at the high school. We have offered dual enrollment, which is slightly different, opportunities for students at the high school for several years where they can actually go to a college campus, take courses there that are then recognized on their transcript. Um, this is slightly different from that, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, essentially, what concurrent enrollment is, is our teachers can become credentialed as adjunct faculty at Middlesex. And then for high school courses that are equivalent to college level courses, students can choose to earn credits from Middlesex while they're sitting at ABRHS taking their high school coursework. Um, the cost is traditionally about $100 to $150 per credit um, and is transferable to most colleges and universities around the country. Um, that is a huge value to many, many, many families. Um, that's something we want to actively pursue and make these opportunities available for our students. So. Uh, we will keep you informed of progress, and I know the high school will be sending out more information as we solidify those plans, but I just wanted to give you that quick update of kind of what's in the works. I also just want to talk very briefly about planning for next year and give you a little insight into what we're thinking about. Our leadership team has been deeply engaged in planning for the 22-23 school year, and over the last few weeks, I've actually had an opportunity to visit most of our schools now and speak with many educators across the schools about their hopes and concerns for students next year. I've also heard highlights from families through surveys, community coffees, and through email. The consistent theme across many, many of our stakeholders is that we have a lot of students struggling um, with social emotional skills and mental and behavioral health challenges. Um, that message is absolutely loud and clear and it's shared among many, many stakeholders. That has been primary um, in all of our minds as a leadership team. And in the coming weeks, I'm hoping to be able to give you a preview of some of what we have planned for next year. Um, we're also um, beginning a process of, you know, uh, we kind of listened to staff first to gauge what they thought the needs were. We've now been developing that plan around social emotional learning and mental and behavioral health for next year. And we're actually just about to share that back with staff and get some more feedback um, from them about what, you know, if they have you know, they see a gap that they'd like us to address or they have a question they think needs to be answered before we roll it out um, so that our leadership team can continue to, to work through that. But I also want to be able to give our families, um, as we head into summer, a little bit of preview of what we're working on for next year as well. So, um, you know, more to come in that regard, but I think social emotional learning, mental and behavioral health needs of students have to be a primary focus. If you look at all evidence on learning and brain-based learning, um, and you follow the, the neuroscience around cognition, you know that when students are experiencing trauma, they cannot engage and learn effectively. Um, it's science, it's proven over and over and over again, and schools are gonna need to be able to adapt to what students have been through over the last two years if we're gonna help them adjust you know, as people but also as students. Um, and if we want to improve academic outcomes, we also have to improve their social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. And I think it's really important that we're able to share that with our community and make sure that everyone understands there's a link between academic performance and the social, emotional needs of our students. So uh, we're looking forward to that and we'll start getting more information out to people over the next few weeks. Thank you, Peter. Any questions for Peter? If you insist. I do. <laughs>
I, I'm really excited about the um, the Middlesex opportunity, you know, and particularly excited because you know one of the challenges in, in a school of our size, which is a good size school, is still to offer the range of things that students would like and provides for the range of experiences. So this kind of activity and more activities like it, I think, you know, are great, you know, as we go forward. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I completely agree. I will share. We actually have um, some private schools as well that are pursuing partnerships with us on some different fronts. Um, one that we were a little bit more in advanced discussions with just had a major change in leadership, and so that has put a little bit of a pause on that, so we're waiting to, to see what comes of it. Um, but we actually are starting to have more and more colleges and universities knowing that we're interested in this pipeline and reaching out and maybe thinking about a partnership. Um, what my eventual goal is to be able to do is actually have a range of opportunities for our students, um, so it's kind of like a menu. Um, and it's not just about any one partnership for us, it's actually about providing choice to families and students about what's gonna work, but also providing the value of being able to go into college. And I think what our goal of this is, is to be able to allow students to really think about the first two years of college, which is mostly general education requirements. Um, there's a tuition piece of this that obviously reduces cost to families, but additionally, it's an opportunity cost too, because if students can enter college with general education requirements under their belt and receive credit, that means they get into their major sooner. Um, and it means even if they're doing their degree in four years, they get a richer, deeper opportunity to take a wider range of courses. So I think it's about cost and it's about opportunity and we're, we're really excited about getting this project going. Evelyn. So as someone who doesn't see equity as a problem, I have an equity question. As we look at getting students the opportunity to take courses at Middlesex, um, are we thinking about this in an equitable way? What if kids that are bright and can take courses at Middlesex cannot afford that fee? What are we doing to be able to support those kids? We don't, I wish I could tell you we have a solution right now, but we're in talks to figure out how to develop maybe some type of a scholarship fund um, for students who cannot afford to access that type of an opportunity. Um, I don't have the firm answer for you, but I do know it's something we're certainly talking about. Because we want to make sure that we're not creating inequity as we advance other kids. Um, slightly different direction of comment on this, but um, while I appreciate that we are pursuing this, because I know lots of other high schools have dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment, I'm kind of disappointed that given that we've had lots of discussions about why so many kids are going to Minuteman and going to other tech schools that we aren't pursuing those kinds of things within our school because we already are like a heavily college driven success, you know, pushing high school in lots of ways and this is just gonna add to that. It's sort of like high school plus college, all in one high school and I just really wish we were giving opportunities to kids that aren't looking for that. Um, you know, there's no one from Boxborough got into any of the tech schools this year, like there was at least 12 students that applied. And, um, you know, I imagine the numbers at Miniman are, are from Acton are even higher than that. I know that there are kids from member towns that didn't get into Minuteman. So that's clearly like an interest and a desire amongst many students, especially given the social emotional challenges that you've mentioned. So I sort of wish we weren't really moving full steam ahead with like more college, but that's just my opinion. Any other comments? No? Thank you. Uh, next up on our agenda are presentations. And first up is the RJ Gray Junior High School presentation with Principal Jim Markoff. Jim, I was hoping to see the ice cream truck make a return for our, our meeting this evening. I like to keep that surprise. I don't know when show up. Jim, you want to sit together or? Do you want to sit? Doesn't matter. What do you? Come on up, Jim. So following Jim will be Principal Joni Dean of the high school. So they're going to come sit next to each other, keep each other company. Clearly about safety and numbers. Exactly. <laughs> Safety numbers is important, and we get along really well, so I'm happy Joni's sitting next to me, and I'll sit next to her when she talks to. Uh, so for those of you who I don't know, I'm Jim Marcotte, I'm the principal of the RJ Gray Junior High. Uh, I am gonna set my timer for 10 minutes, because I was told 10 minutes is important, so. 
If I can interrupt, yes. You'll notice he didn't say interim principal. He said principal at R.J. Gray. I just want to make sure we clarify that. Pause your timer. Yeah, we'll pause for the applause. I'll take more applause later if you want. Um, no, I appreciate that, Peter. It's been a great year for me. Um, I'm very happy to be continuing as the principal of the junior high. So um, thanks for letting us talk tonight. So, you know, the goal of me sharing with you tonight is just to tell you kind of what we've been working on, um, kind of big picture, and with some specific examples as they come up. But if you've been, if you're a parent of the junior high and you've seen some of the stuff I've written or if your student goes to us, they know that the expression we've been using this year is we're building a joyful, inclusive community of engaged learners. And those three pieces, the joyful part, the community, and the engaged learners is important. It has really guided a lot of our work and a lot of our planning as we go forward. Um, so I kind of broke down my presentation around those three buckets of things. And you know, we really, as I, as I took over the position after having been at the high school, junior high, excuse me, for a long time, prior as an assistant principal, I recognized like there was a void where we weren't really finding the joy and the fun is what I think a middle school should, in should include. Um, and so we have been purposeful this year in trying to do that. Um, our schedules that each team operates get pretty fixed and it's hard for teachers to find, oh, let's do an hour and a half activity that focuses on one thing. And so we built into our master calendar team community building days. Um, we put three days on the calendar that you know, all eighth grade would engage in some activity that their teachers had planned for them. Uh, we had to skip the one in January because our COVID numbers were way up and we didn't want to take risk. But um, you know, we had fun days that included things like um, obstacle courses out on Leary Field. Uh, we had people making scarecrows back in our fall day. There were board game and puzzle competitions and kind of a lot of team challenges, uh, moving a golf ball from one end of the gym lobby to the other using PVC pipe. So kind of teamwork stuff that we wanted kids to engage with that it is Teacher Appreciation Week, but we have amazing teachers who pulled that all off for us so, and for our students, so we're psyched about that. Uh, we got into a habit this year, especially at the beginning of the year, about our morning announcements, it's something that I always begin, and then we've gotten back in the practice of having students do our announcements, but for a while we were asking a kind of a question of the day, and the, the one, one in the fall that I remember stuck out, stuck out to me because I had a strong opinion on it, you know, is apple picking worthwhile? Um, and so in the homeroom that the kids were hearing that announcement, there was a quick conversation. So bringing a little bit of joy and a little bit of community, uh, which is the part that comes next, of course. Um, I highlighted there our Thanksgiving assembly. We had a relay race of, you know, <laughs> pumpkin pie and turkey and um, canned cranberry sauce back and forth across the gym in a really fun in the atmosphere. And I'll be super honest that kind of watching that all unfold was when I was, more firm in my belief that I do want to continue to be the principal here. Um, and so that environment and that kind of fun, just seeing 12 and 13 and 14 year olds interact that way affected me and I think affects some of our kids too, for sure. We brought back things like spirit days, pajama day, formal dress day, things like that. And we're very happy to have our athletics back, our clubs and activities meeting fully in person. Um, and really, you know, pretty popular for a lot of them. This year, we've um, twice now, in November and then in March, we've done a student survey to try to collect some information on things that matter to us and things that are you know, based on our school goals. And so I just pointed out one here, and this is a slide that I actually used last week for sixth grade info night. You know, for sixth grade parents who are nervous, oh, my kid's coming to the junior high for the first time, I flashed this up there. 97% of kids said this year they made new friends. To me, that's important. You know, there are 3% there who named that as not being the case. We're concerned about that. Um, but I think we have a strong showing there that says that something's happening in our school that kids feel good about being with each other. Um, working on our inclusive community, we, through our morning announcements and through other avenues, have been trying to recognize holidays and celebrations. So, you know, I know it doesn't matter. It, should, it, should, it is, and it is, should be bigger than just February, for example, for Black History Month. But every day that month, we had a fact or a quote or a person of interest that we read about in the morning announcements that now is represented on a bulletin board in the front lobby. Um, I had a student write to me <clears throat> a few weeks ago saying, Mr. Marcotte, can I come on the morning announcements and talk about Ramadan? Sure you can, come on down. So we've been trying to find ways to make that feel a little bit um, stronger of an inclusive community. I put up there Common Ground, which is our LGBTQ plus group um, that includes allies as well. It's been a really strong group this year. 18 to 20 students attend weekly meetings to connect with each other. Uh, we have a great advisor who just last week brought students to Worcester to see Prom, the musical. Um, I don't know if you call it a musical, Prom, the show. Um, and a couple parents went and the kids had an amazing time. So it's really, that's a highlight of what we've seen this year. Um, 
we had a, a goal in our school improvement plan that for EL families particularly, we were going to find ways to connect with them face to face this year. Um, and that's a, a group that we've recognized over the years doesn't always get the face time or the interaction that may go to other families who, who have English as their primary language. So I will shout out in a big way our academic support center and our EL team um, that really works to engage with these families using um, new mechanisms of communication, including the Remind app has been a great way for us to connect with a lot of families. So, um, you know, we're not 100% on that, so we need more work to do, but it's a point that we have made really important this year. Um, we have had a lot of conversations and we've had two attempts at um, a first meeting of a student affinity group. And we're purposeful, you know, we're following up, we know what the decision about coming out of Wellesley was about affinity groups, and we're calling it a group that says, if you want to, I think the way we word it, if you want to talk about race in a positive, negative, or neutral way, come to this group. Um, and we have, a, we have an advisor who's ready to lead it. Um, we haven't done what we need to do to reach out individually and make some potential invitations and kind of get that going. So while we've begun the planning for it, I do believe in next year that will be right from the beginning, something that will um, really firmly take, take hold and be great for our students. And we're also going to be planning, for, we have been planning for our advisory program to start next year, which I'll talk about particularly in a slide or two. This is another question from our survey. Um, you know, and there's a lot of it that makes me feel great. There's a lot of it that makes me feel like, ooh, we're not there yet. Um, so the question being, I feel welcome to be myself. You know, I look at things that say, strongly agree, um, agree and somewhat agree, like hmm, the somewhat is a little bit iffy for me, but you know, at that point we're seeing 23% and 43% saying, yep, I agree with that, I can be myself here. Um, so we have a lot more work to do, I think advisory will help us with this a little bit to get students to really own their identity and feel you know, who they are, and yet they are 12 and 13 and 14 and they're still figuring that out. So if someone doesn't answer that affirmatively at this moment, there could be reasons that we need to know about as well as it could be a developmental piece that we're looking at. The final piece that we talk about is engaged learning. Our staff went through a UDL training this year and really the conversations now that we have are, are different than in prior years because it's now talking about like, all right, what's the barrier that that student is facing? How do we remove that barrier for the student to access? You know, we're certainly, we've been for a while, you know, a lot of student voice and student choice and activities and assignments, um, but that has become more common language with our staff. Um, in our English fundamentals program, so students with IEPs whose potential reading level is significantly below grade level for other reasons they might be in a what we have always used as kind of a, a separate English class where for next year pursuing a co-teaching model we're pushing back into the regular the general education English class you know English teacher special educator connecting and working with students together so we're really excited about that there will excuse me be growing pains we know but it's the right thing to do and we're really pursuing that for the first time at the junior high, we've used iReady uh, three times. We'll, we'll do our third assessment in ELA and in math, in reading and in math this year. We are working on, given the assessment is easy, taking the data and modifying our instruction and all that is where we now need to continue to grow. So, you know, I'm naming for you all the things we're working on and saying like, oh, but we're not there yet, which I hope you appreciate is just the ongoing work that we'll be doing. Uh, the final point on this slide is for our Compass program, which is our social emotional learning center. Um, we have had issues at, at points where we feel not great because some of our students dealing with their social emotional challenges are in the learning center too much. They can't make it to science that day. They can't make it to English that day. We have looked at our incoming, our next year kind of profile. We figured out a way to say, all right, a team teacher, for example, teaches five English classes. They're going to teach four full-size English classes, and that fifth class is going to be focused on the instruction that some students from Compass may need. Ideally, and the goal is, those Compass students attend English in the class of 22 students. On the day that they can't make it there, the English teacher will come to them. And so we're working in a way using our, you know, our, our current size, um, and we've actually just reshifted out, we've shifted our team assignments for teachers. So we have people now on the teams associated with Compass who really want to engage in this. So we're very excited about it. We have 45 seconds left. I'm, still, I'm gonna miss my 10 minutes. Um, we asked a question, how often do you actively participate in class? You know, and that's a, that's a strong showing for us that you know, always and often and sometimes, yeah, those are, those are good numbers. Um, we wanna make sure we're knowing what does it actually mean to participate. 
was in a class today and recognizing in my head, huh, if you're an introvert, how are you feeling right now? And there's ways to be involved and participate that don't always mean verbally. Finally, the biggest goal that we have for next year is implementing our advisory program. And we're taking it simple in year one, and the goals are forming connections and relationships with other students and an adult. Um, we're gonna make those a, a looping connection. So if you start next year as a seventh grader, same group, same adult, into the following year. All right, I missed it. I'll get like 12 minutes maybe. Um, we really, again, the, the goal being forming relationships. Um, we want students to be able to be themselves, and yet we want to create this space that feels good to students and teachers in the event that there is something we have to talk about as a school, we have that space. Um, and we want to embed in there a lot of our, you know, our, the work that we want to do around social emotional learning and DEI work. Um, when we create that small environment, you know, up to 12 students is our goal in a particular group. Um, advisory is going to meet three times a week on a, t on a typical week. You know, a four-day week feels a little bit different and we'll adjust, but on a Monday and a Friday, a 10-minute check-in after second period with your advisory group. And that could be a quick game, it could be a quick, you know, community circle or something. And then on a Wednesday after lunch will be a 25-minute session where um, that's where we'll do more of the kind of heavy lifting type work. We want it to still be fun, still high level, high interest stuff, um, but that's where we know we'll embed some of the work that we want to accomplish. Um, we've had a great team of staff members really into it this year and really working with us to come up as far as we have come with this particular plan. You know, and our ultimate goal is to improve this number, which says um, if you have a problem or concern, you have a teacher in your building, about 80% right now says, yes, I have somebody. With advisory, I want that number to be much stronger because I think that's the goal is creating connections for kids. Um, with other kids and other adults too. Um, the other questions that match this one on the, the student survey asked, if I have a problem or concern, I have a family member at home. That number was higher, it's in the 90s. If I have a problem or concern, I have a peer who I can go to also in the 90s. So our kids are very connected, and which, is, which I think is a really important piece to know. Um, but we certainly wanna work on what we have to be able, the ability to control, which is our adults and our students um, working together. And so there I am at the end of my 12 minutes or so. So I'm open to comments or questions if you have any um, before we turn it to Joni. Thanks, Jim. Joni, you've got to beat 12, I think, is the number. Eight. I think there's no <laughs> shot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen her slides. Tessa, go ahead. I just want to acknowledge what a great job you do there. We have had two experiences of an incredibly challenging junior high, and I just want to note that like 13 and 12 and 13 and 14 year olds are, I don't know how you guys do it. I, if I had to spend all day, every day, 180 days a year with 12, 13 and 14 year olds, I would have a really difficult time. And people ask me like all the time, ooh, but what about the junior high? And I honestly think that the junior high is one of our greatest schools that we have here. I think that the things that you're doing are amazing. And I think the places where we as a family have felt struggles may be um, answered by things like advisory. I think that that advisory thing is awesome because I think that there's only so much you can control. <laughs> I think you have phenomenal staff and I think the things that are part of the curriculum are really good. I think the pieces you don't have control over are the other students. And yeah. so advisory I think is an amazing thing that I, I'm not gonna say I wish we were still gonna be at the junior high to see that, but I'm happy for the other kids who will Two years at a time is enough to stay at the junior high. Two years high. is enough. Yeah. No, and to that point, Tess, I appreciate that. Um, you know, people say, oh, Jim, your job's so hard. Like, it, it's not as hard as the teacher's job. Like, the teachers are killing themselves to, you know, make connections and good stuff for kids. Um, and we are where we are because Andrew Shen was the principal for nine years, you know? So I am very lucky to be taking over after someone very competent and who put the school in the place that it's in. So I appreciate that. I hope he's watching. He's, uh, <laughs> shout out. Any other questions for Jim? Uh, Jim, John. you already have the job. Yeah. Say it again? You Her. already have the job. I do, I know. <laughs> I appreciate that. Go ahead, John. Uh, you, you talked a lot about um, the importance of the mental state of the students and trying to understand where we are and how things are going for them. And of course, you know, students are, and how they feel impacts their families and vice versa. Um, but the community, of course, also includes uh, the staff and, you know, how they are feeling at this point in the year. And I wonder if you could say a few words about um, 
you know, how you feel about the, the mental health of the staff, um, particularly because it is Teacher Appreciation Week. No, it's a good question. Um, and I say to them often, you know, when we get together, that I'm, I'm very happy to be with them. Oh, he, he texted me, I'm watching, good job. So that was from Mr. Shen. <laughs> I knew he was. Um, the day actually that I was interviewing, um, you know, the day long kind of site visit, I, it was funny, I had run a staff meeting and then I went and put on my suit coat and became the candidate for the position. And Peter and Marie were in the library watching as well. And there was a well-respected teacher who said, Jim, like you're talking about really exciting things. How are we gonna do all of this? And I, I completely appreciate it in the idea that like, yeah, or we're really balancing a lot on the backs of people who have families and children and outside commitments. And I reference that point, my wife's a teacher, my sister's a teacher, like I, I get that teacher vibe. Um, I think the junior high has a lot going for it in that you know, our team model really lets teachers support each other with the support of the administration as included, but you know, they're, they're not on an island by themselves trying to manage this. There really is a, a teamwork focus actually being set up on teams or in departments that are you know, not necessarily on team groups. But yeah, I mean, you know, when Mike Balowski gets up and talks later, ask him that question about how, the vibe of our staff. I will say, and I think I'm not being you know, too idealistic that we're in a very good place. I think teachers are very appreciative of the work that the district is doing. People are on board with what we're trying to do. When we gave the advisory, when we gave a summary of advisory, it was back in February at a staff meeting. You know, a little bit we prepared for like, oh, how is this gonna go over? No one, no one can dispute the goals behind it. We wanna work to make experiences better for kids and then actually, in effect, better for teachers themselves. So, you know, while there are questions about like, I've never done this before, how am I gonna pull this off? And that's a legit question. Um, I think the, the, what they're seeing us do is work towards making kids' lives as good as they can be while they're only with us for two years. So um, my take on the state of the staff at the junior high is that we're doing really well. Uh, and I think people are pretty positive about our work. But ask Mike B when he comes up. Can I ask a question? A question for the principal? Let me just see one more round around the committee. Sure. Anybody else on the committee have a question for Jim? No? Come on back up to the microphone, please. You are doing well. Here you go. So I did hear you talk a lot about the um, children and their emotions and the teachers. And my, my only question is, have you, it's kind of outside of the box. Sure. And I think we treat our kids so differently now than than we did back then, and school kind of hasn't changed. Like, they still sit in class, they still... Have, is there any kind of... Like, I think they communicate better with other kids. And I was wondering if there's any kind of program or thought process to maybe having some high schoolers help out the junior high kids, and maybe it would, you know, give... They could earn some credit or get some, you know, kind of something in that, and, and it might you know, there might be experience that they can talk about with them that can be overseen by a staff member, rather than just feeling like you wanna, you know, get all these kids comfortable to talk to the staff members, which is maybe a little bit unrealistic, you know. So maybe that you could intertwine them a little bit and it might make a confidence boost for the high school kids and give some direction for the junior high kids with maybe an overseer, I mean, is that, Yes. <laughs> so let me give you a couple of examples of what I think, you know, we have had and prior to COVID went away, but you bring up a good point. Why couldn't we bring those things back? Um, the particular example I have right now is the ambassador program at the high school, which is high school students that we connect when they're coming up into the ninth grade. We connect experienced high schoolers with the new freshmen coming in. Um, that doesn't directly affect the junior high. At some point, um, for many years, we had the peer leader program from the high school and students would come to the junior high, um, particular days of the week and particular periods, to meet with students who we knew this was an important connection. Um, and I'll be very honest, I believe that that fell apart a little bit when the high school no longer had a fixed schedule. So yeah. if a student had fourth period off every day, it was easy for them to come to junior high. Where it now rotates, it's more complicated. But you bring up a good point. Um, the community that we're hoping to connect in advisory is not only about adults to students, but it's the students to students and getting them to get connected. Um, and, you know, 
hopefully process with each other like, oh yeah, that was a really terrible thing that happened on social media or whatever, right? right but right. you're right, I think the example of uh, older students may very well serve us well. So as Joni and I know, keep working together, you bring up a really good point that no, we should I just wanted appreciate. to throw it out there. No, I, just, I really do appreciate it. You know, that. I think they learn so much from each other that right. sometimes when we talk, they're like, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have three kids of my so. own. Not quite that old yet, but I do hear that too. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Jen. Okay, you're welcome. Joni. Welcome. Thank you. What do I have, eight minutes? The time to beat is 12, I believe. <laughs> I'm going to try for 10. OK, good evening. It's really great to be here. Um, after almost one year of, of being here, um, even more excited now than I was, was before. Um, there's a lot that's been going on in the high school, and I'm excited to share that with you tonight. I will do um, sort of two portions, and the first one will probably be a little shorter, just in terms of what's been going on this year goals and updates, and then um, related in terms of me coming in and what I've assessed and everyone's helped me think about, I'll just share some entry findings in, in, in the form of questions in four different category areas, and that will hopefully frame some of our work going forward. All right. So to start with a year in review, I think it's appropriate to first talk about some celebrations and then some actual realities uh, additionally of the year. We're coming out of COVID, um, still in COVID in many regards. So first of all, I just wanna say that it has been amazing to witness for this year, and I think everyone here knows this, that through flexibility, creativity, and tremendous work, we've been able to continue to provide an outstanding education, along with a lot of support for our students in the third year of the pandemic. I think we have many academic successes, and additionally, and probably as important, especially during this time, is the social and emotional support that we're able to provide for students. Um, we see that in classrooms. Um, the work that teachers have done through UDL training this year our counseling and support staff and how they hold children, and also our peer-to-peer -peer assistant and support for students. I've been really impressed with from the beginning of the year with the ambassadors program, through all of our class meetings, um, school spirit days, all the way through this end of the year as we're celebrating our end of year celebrations and what that means to our community. I think with great enthusiasm, we're able to bring back lots of in-person events this year. And that has been refreshing and therapeutic. Um, I could list a number of events, which many of you probably know better than I do. Veterans Day breakfast, senior dress-up day, was absolutely amazing to feel the electricity in the gym after two years off. <laughs> um, our grade level meetings, our athletic events, World Language Week, we were able to bring that back this year. Um, P and Health Day is in-person performances. Right now, Matilda is going on. We recently had our spring concert at Mechanics Hall in Worc Worcester. We recently had our NHS induction. We were able to have 12th grade community service day last week. I'm so impressed that over 400 seniors work in over 60 different community service projects on one day. It's an amazing testament to our community and our values, and just logistically being able to pull that off. We are all looking forward to prom tomorrow. That may be why some students aren't here tonight. <laughs> and I can't wait for graduation at the end of the year. And I know students and families uh, feel the same way. All right, if we were to talk about the realities of this year, um, I'm just going to say the challenges of a pandemic and the impacts on teaching and learning have been real. And in terms of the social and emotional um, place that students are in. And also, I'm probably going to uh, share a harsher uh, perspective of where teachers are in the high school. 
um, than Jim did. <laughs> um, and no, I just, it, both are accurate. Um, in the high school, this, is, this has been tough and this has been a lot, and it's been a lot for teachers. And Teacher Appreciation Week comes at the perfect time. Um, yep, so I, I would say that um, working through all that with students and teachers at the same time is something that is real and continue to be appreciative of all of that and recognizing where we are is important. Talking about specifically this year and what we worked on, um, if, you, if you think about students um, first and then, and then we talk about faculty, I'd say that we were fo focusing from the beginning of the year on a culture of care, especially coming into, uh, into in-person school, coming out of pandemic, uh, thinking about pandemic emergent students and, and teachers. So we were focusing on the social and emotional needs of students first and, and then also academics. And so those have been our main focus this year. Where are students? How can we meet them where they are, even if it's not the same as they were two years ago in this very same class? And so that's really been a focus for us this year. Our diversity, equity, and inclusion work has focused on equity coaching with um, Michelle Shannon. We've had some great student events this year. Our Dear Asian Youth Group led all of our AB affinity groups in a forum this fall. We also had a, our queer youth walk out recently. Implementing our anonymous online reporting system I think has been helpful in um, providing opportunities for students to share incidents with us. I'd say that in terms of responding to hate and bias incidents, a focus on education and restoration has been key this year and we're gonna continue to work in those veins faculty and staff. As I said before, the impacts of COVID and how that has affected staff is real. Um, I would say that um, a, attendance and student behavior and how that's affected everything that's going on in, in the school is something that we want to pay careful attention to. Sorry, we are paying careful attention to. I would say the administrators in the um, high school are now devoting about three hours a day to just following up on attendance and attendance issues and how that impacts um, student learning and their behavior. Um, okay. I wanna comment on teacher workload. Um, that has been a phrase in the high school this year and a lot of this comes out of COVID. So at the beginning of the year we had a a committee to advise uh, to examine teacher workload in the high school and in terms of how many classes different departments were teaching. Um, additionally, teachers have been focused on examining our schedule and how that has impacted their workload this year. I, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to my entry findings. Um, in terms of focused work, DEI and cultural response practice has been at the heart of things that we have done in curriculum analysis. Um, again, our equity coaching work with Dr. Michelle Shannon and um, our early college initiatives are something on the front burner as Peter was noting. Additionally, we had PL focused on community building circles in November for teachers. Um, our early release collaboration time has been focused on UDL and departmental collaboration, UDL is universal design for learning. And then I'd say the last uh, area of focused work is in examining our course levels at the high school um, in order to examine and provide uh, increasingly advanced coursework for all students, um, equitable opportunities, and increasingly diverse learning experiences. And so we're forming a PLC, a professional learning community to help examine um, our course levels at the high school. I think my timer's off and I don't know how long. <laughs> All right, I don't have much time. All right, I want to share some of my entry findings with you now, the second portion of my um, presentation. I want to say, first of all, I express a great deal of gratitude to the entire community for their welcome and um, how supportive they've been. And that hasn't just been for me. I noticed that in our community, um, and that comes out in pride and care in everything that we do. I say that our excellence in terms of academics and activities is apparent 
and something that's living and breathing and that I, I experience and notice and I believe everyone does in our school on a daily basis. Focus on social and emotional learning and diversity, equity, and inclusion are at the forefront of what we're talking about and what is important in this district. I'm very excited about that. I think that that's incredibly important. And I think that as Peter said before, in order to continue excellence in academics and activities, that's necessary. If I were to talk about what I've noticed and what other people have helped me thoughtfully understand about this school and how to move forward in this district, um, I was able to organize my thoughts into four categories. And so I will now go through those four categories. I'll just list them for you quickly. First is mission, vision, values. Second is school climate and culture. Third is teaching and learning. And fourth is school operations and structure. And so if I'm gonna talk about mission, vision, value, I'd say that it's, it's apparent that AB has a history of excellence in all facets of academics and activities, as I've said before. I think that everyone takes great pride in all that AB represents. Um, I have also noticed that due to time and space constraints, educational practices and approaches can be specific to departments or groups within the high school. Um, additionally, and mostly, I'm over my tide. <laughs> my daughter <laughs> programmed that. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> Mostly due to remote and hybrid learning of the pandemic, there's been great impact on, social, on students' social and emotional development, and that's affected their well-being and school performance. I'd say that in the future, we are gonna focus on developing a set of mission, vision, and value statement of which we can then look through other decisions and programs within the high school that we can look through that lens. Um, I think that in terms of uh, the significant factors that affected teenagers, unlike ever before from the pandemic, we need to consider the impact of the pandemic. A societal focus on social justice inequities and the mental health um, situation of all our students and staff as we develop our mission statements and, and revise our handbook. And so my two questions for mission, vision, val values, um, are framed in first the vision of a student experience in what ways can we develop a school-wide shared vision of the student experience that centers students and promotes collaboration between our departments and staff members. We can model that for our students and have a shared experience. The second one in terms of student behavior, how do we implement an approach to student behavior that reflects our vision of a student experience and our commitment to restorative and equitable practices. In particular, um, framing that through after the mission, vision, values, uh, our handbook. My next category, and I'll try to go quickly, school, culture, and climate. I would say that um, we have a great support team at, at the high school. Um, this year we've been examining advisory, and we've also been examining how we respond to incidents of hate and bias. Opportunities ahead for us in this area include um, implementing our advisory program once a week next year instead of once a month. And we're working in a committee right now to develop plans for that. Um, and I'm happy that we can partner some of our work with the, with the junior high. Um, continued focus on uh, DEI work and including student voice and feedback in all we do. And I say that we have few questions here. First, community spirit. How can we continue to build upon the high school's success and its warm, caring spirit? Diversity, equity, inclusion. How can we continue to foster the school's social justice, equity, and inclusion philosophy and goals within the curriculum, student support, and community events? A robust advisory program. In what ways can we provide a meaningful advisory program for students within our given schedule and staffing constraints? Social and emotional well-being and learning, how can we continue to focus on balancing students' social and emotional well-being with, within their academic achievement, uh, with their, sorry, balance social and emotional well-being with their academic achievement and success? Okay, teaching and learning. Um, we, of course, have a very successful high school in teaching and learning. I wanna bring up again the realities of teacher workload this year and the examination of how many classes teachers were teaching in the different department. Additionally, there were many strong feelings about our schedule. Two years ago, we moved to 
the rotating schedule in which one of the blocks dropped. And when I say um, a dislike, that was among a good portion of the teachers. So we spent some time examining that this year. Um, we had uh, a group working on it that met for two and a half months. We conducted a survey and we talked about it. The final decision was to continue with the current survey for at least two more years until we go through a mission, vision, values process and then evaluate our schedule through that. Overwhelmingly, students and families, I believe, like our schedule. Um, focus on student engagement is important and then thinking about our course levels is another thing that we're going to examine in the future. And so if I were to put that in, in uh, the questions, I would say that teacher workload, how can we move forward in a way that manages teacher workload and focuses, in, focuses on improving student outcomes? Engagement, how can we continue to assess and improve teaching and learning in order to fully engage all of our students? Course levels, how can we ensure academically challenging courses equitable opportunities and diverse learning environments for all students. All right, lastly, and this will be the shortest one, school operations and structures. We have a large school, many people, many people are working simultaneously on different tasks. Communication and coordination is paramount. And so some opportunities ahead for us include, next year we're gonna rework our administrator structure so that each administrator is not working with 850 students, but rather 425 students each, and in groups of teams with counselors to improve the focus around students, which is needed right now as students are coming, as we are coming out of um, the pandemic and coordination between the adults in the building. And so questions along this lines, um, there are two of them. School leadership, how can we, how can the high school staff and leadership team best work together on a shared set of goals to unify school-wide efforts and encourage cross-departmental communities of educators. And secondly, school operations, how do we identify areas to adjust in order to best manage the daily operations and communications across the school? Thank you for listening to my entire presentation. I think I, will, I went well over my eight or my 10 minutes. I wanna say again, as I started, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for listening, and thank you to everyone who helped contribute to what I put together. Thank you very much, Joni. Questions from the committee? Next time, I'll just go like this, John. And the important thing is he said questions. <laughs> um, I, I think you know one of the things sitting here as a school committee member is you always wonder you know what can I do to help you, um, and there are lots of things that you talk about that are extremely interesting. And it's like not sure what I can do as a school committee member, but there were um, two things you know one that came up sort of tangentially and one that's more direct that maybe do relate to what the school committee can weigh in on. You know, one of those questions you know with respect to the high school experience, and I very much appreciated Jim's comment that. Um, the teachers operating team at the middle school just have a completely different experience yeah. than other things. And I think it, it, that's so important to keep in mind. And I'm going to come back to that at the end. But in terms of the high school, um, you know, I was wondering if, you know, difficulties in getting subs had been you know, a significant contributing factor to problems. Because if that's true, then, you know, as the school committee works on budget and things, question about how we're compensating or what we might, there are things that we could really be involved in to do something about that. Um, and then the second thing that, I, you know, I thought about, you know, on your slides um, in the packet, they linked out to the school improvement plan. And the school improvement plan, of course, well, of course we should have a plan to improve our schools, but maybe it shouldn't come out of mass general law. Maybe you know, we could be using, you know, our resources that we want to devote to improving our individual schools in some different kind of way. And um, the role of the school committee with regard to those, you know, school improvement plans, you know, is really, again, much more to receive. Here's what we, we, we think we're going to do. But there's a different role for the school committee if, in fact, you believe that these activities are not the best use of our resources, and that's to tell the school committee that um, some lobbying with the legislature to reconsider, you know, this a aspect of educational law, you know, would have s some merit. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, you know, you, 
I assume you had no idea there was this structure when you came in to the high school. And among the many things, it's like, really, this is what we're going to do? So what was your, your feeling about having gone through this process? The school improvement plan process. Yeah. Yeah, it was different to me. And, and I also think that, and this has been typical of my AB experience, I think that you can find meaning in anything that you do, and I found the process meaningful, and, and how we worked as a, as a district, even over the summer, to, to start to put plans in place for our school improvement plan, and then the work with the, the parents and the students and teachers who were on that committee, I found incredibly useful over the course of the year to get feedback and help frame our goals for next year. So. It's hard for me to say, also being new to Massachusetts, exactly my uh, complete analysis of your question, John, but I think that uh, leaving that to the side, I have found the process helpful and useful because we've been able to do it in a meaningful way. To your first question um, about substitutes, I mean, I think Marie could probably answer that better than me, but we have been doing a good job of getting more substitutes in in the high school when we need them this year um, in order to provide support for our students. So I've been grateful for that. And then the, the one other thing that I wanted to comment on was um, the, the choice of the uh, phrase, the student experience. So we're about to enter the end of the year where you know we'll have a chance to celebrate a lot of things that students have done through the years academically, athletically. And I think anybody who goes through that process and you know watches um, our graduates um, you know, in June will recognize how many different experiences there were. So while it's true that there are some things that are shared, our students are actually diversifying through the process. And so they and we you know, should feel comfortable that there will be a multitude of experiences, hopefully all good ones, but there will be no singular experience. That is understood and something that we certainly need to, to be careful of, and, and we wouldn't want anything to be completely lockstep or uniform. And of course, that's part of a high school experience, and one of the reasons why high school educators love the high school and being in it is because of all the differences and growth. And so hopefully that will be embedded in whatever we create as our student experience goal or vision. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Joni? None? No, John, you're done. You've used your allotment. <laughs> All right. Thank you both, Jim thank and you. Tony. I just want to both thank both of you. Um, you know, really tremendous first years, very different experiences for both of you. You know, Jim, you came in as an interim um, and really just proved through all of the work you did that, you know, you certainly had staff support. Um, you know, to really move you forward as the principal. I mean, it was unquestionable. Same thing, and I know, you know, I, I heard from many people in the community that, you know, Facebook lit up and it was like, you know, the first thing in the, a while that the community felt like, yes, we all buy into this together. Um, so, you know, congratulations on that. And I think, you know, your ability to see the school from inside and keep things moving forward quickly really shown through. You know, and Joni, you had a different experience where you're coming in and, you know, you didn't have the opportunity of being in that school for nine or ten years previously. So, you know, you've just been really thoughtful and I know I've heard from many, many staff in the school that they really feel like you listen. Um, and I've heard that from students, I've heard it from families, that, you know, you just, you listen to people, you acknowledge how they're feeling about things and you're able to work in ways to bring people to consensus and just taking that lens to the high school, I really appreciate all the work you've done. So thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, on to our ongoing business. So in a few moments, There are different ways of understanding the colonials as a symbol, for some heroic and for others threatening. When the school committee voted to retire the colonials mascot, the decision was made with our current students at the forefront of our minds. And the intention was to begin the search for a mascot that unified our students and did not exclude any members of our community. Some have feared that we are canceling or erasing the important history of our community. Our schools do and will continue to teach the rich and important history of our town and region. What we intend to do, what we intend is to broaden understanding and learn from each other 
and we are proud that the process of selecting a new mascot has done just that. The mascot subcommittee and the students have listened closely, engaging with the community, and incorporated their feedback throughout the process. Our students' voices have led this process. One thing we know is that the Colonials alumni who feel great pride in the Colonials mascot can, should, and will always be Colonials. It's time, however, to move forward as a community, and we hope you will join us in supporting the new mascot of Acton Boxborough. As we move forward in this process, we'll find opportunities to recognize our past and celebrate our future. And with that, Peter, I'll hand it over to you. All right, so thank you, Adam. So, you know, there's a memo in your packet, um, and along with a memo from uh, Principal Dean, and then we included some of the, you know, final survey data from the community survey that we sent out. Um, you know, I, I just want to recognize, you know, similar to Adam's sentiments, I think, you know, I want to make sure we understand that in the retiring the mascot, it was that it, it's not, we have to stop seeing the world in black and white, and, you know, we have to think in terms of there's a range of feelings in that, and I think that is embodied in our community. And the nature of the Colonials was a complex one in this community. And, you know, I think, you know, as you said, and I said in my memo, you know, this is not about changing the period of time that we were the Colonials. Um, I think we can actually always celebrate that period of time because many, many great things happened in this community during that period of time where the Colonials well represented our schools. I think what this is is about looking forward um, and thinking about who our students want to represent them as they move forward. I want to also recognize before we, you know, share what the, the actual name of this is, that, you know, there are many in the community who really wish it still was the Colonials, and I want to acknowledge that, and I think, you know, we need to do a little reconciliation around that and say that, you know, we can understand why people felt value in that, and I want to make sure that that statement and sentiment isn't lost in how we move this forward. Um, our students started this process. We turned it over to them. We had a mascot subcommittee, as you recall, that was um, tasked with leading the charge, but only so far as providing guidance to students and providing feedback about how they were moving through the process. I have to tell you, I can't believe the work that this group of students did. And I, you know, rarely do I speak for a group, but I know I speak on behalf of the whole mascot renaming subcommittee that we were on a you know meeting by meeting basis impressed with the quality of work the students were producing, not only in their own deliberations with themselves, but also their ability to take in community input, which was at times challenging to read, um, and be able to synthesize that in a way that they felt could represent the community as a whole in moving the school forward. Um, another thing we were impressed with with our kids was their ability to, you know, have deliberated usually, you know, by the time they came to a subcommittee meeting, my guess is they probably met between one and three and maybe even four hours um, in between meetings of the subcommittee. And, you know, they were able to, you know, take what they got to and listen um, to, you know, feedback that was really designed to push their thinking around different topics and then bring that back to the student group and help move that thinking forward yet again. So er I think every time our students who are on the subcommittee came forward, you could see tangible ways that they had then worked with the rest of the students to incorporate that feedback. So I'm just really, I, I, I can't speak highly enough of the students involved in this. Um, and I wanna also recognize and thank all of the staff that helped guide them through the process. I think this was very emotional for our students to go through. Um, their you know, was a, there were multiple points along the way that they were certainly getting frustrated and, you know, they weren't sure what direction to go in and yet they kept coming back and working through the challenge at hand um, in order to bring something forward. So, you know, I'm really pleased, you know, to be able to report that the final consensus vote of the student group was a unanimous choice to move forward with a name for the mascot and the mascot renaming subcommittee of the school committee also voted unanimously to support the name that we're moving forward. I'll read that name for you now um, and the description that the students wanted. Before I do that, I'll also note that we had you know, several people who are professionals in the branding industry who are also uh, in our community who gave us a lot of feedback along the way saying do not 
visually represent this yet. Um, that comes later. Instead, talk about what you want for the term and put the definition out there so that you're really clear in defining what you want for a term. And so there's no visual representation at this point. That could come later. Um, but let me share what the, the name was. So the proposed name is the Acton-Boxborough or AB Revolution. Um, the description, the fight for positive change and equity never ends. It's the voice of the people, a revolution. It acknowledges our past, but speaks to our future. We are innovators, barrier breakers, and difference makers. A revolution represents a show of ingenious strength, challenging, outsmarting, and overwhelming the status quo. So that's the AB revolution as proposed by our students. So we're pleased to present that to you. What we are doing, um, we're considering this a first read. I'm gonna make the recommendation that we send this out to the community for some public comment over the next two weeks um, and give the community an opportunity one more time um, to be able to write in um, to the school committee with their comments on this, which you can then consider. And we're move, we'd like to have you consider this for a second read slash vote at your next meeting on May 19th. So I'm happy to answer any questions and you know, hear, hear initial thoughts and feedback. Thanks, Peter. From the committee, thoughts? Feedback, questions? Okay, at this point then I'll open it up to the public. So similar to public participation, we'll give you three minutes each and uh, similar, uh, we'll take the feedback in but questions may not be answered at this time. Well, how many kids, how many kids want we to have to come up to the microphone. Like I said, you've got to come to the mic during the public participation option and so questions like, like I've said before, questions won't be answered at this time, but those can be forwarded to the superintendent who can respond then. Go ahead. Thank you. Change is hard and we are in good company. AB is one of at least four schools that have challenged the colonial mascot. George Washington University Colonial history professors Dane Kennedy and Denver Brunsman spoke in support of changing their colonial mascot. Professor Brunsman said, this conversation has demonstrated that the Colonials offends a broad cross-section of the campus community, particularly international students and faculty who come from areas still fresh with memories of colonialism. He also said, the term colonial denotes a power relationship of one group over another. AB students bravely spoke out against that oppression. I am grateful for AB's institutional courage in retiring the divisive community mascot. Being the first to do the right thing is hard. Thank you for centering equity for all. Yes to the AB revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Martin Benson, 21 Deacon Hunt Drive. Uh, I have a few questions just for the committee to answer. Uh, one, the FF District Facilities Naming Policy forbids political pressure from affecting the school committee's decision to retire and rename the colonial mascot. However, the school committee cited the support of State Senator Jamie Eldridge, State Representative Tammy Govea, as well as Progressive Group Indivisible Acting during their meeting on October 15, 2020. Records requests show Ms. Govea was in concurrent communications with school committee members on how to push back against those supporting the colonial mascot. This is no coincidence. At the time, Ms. Govea was trying to get her offensive mascot bill passed into law. Additionally, the mascot subcommittee was required to select a mascot which represents the school district's anti-racist and social justice goals. Yet social justice and anti-racism are considered political movements. How does the school committee contend the retirement and renaming of the mascot has not been impacted by political pressure? Mr. Benson, like I've said before, we won't be answering questions during this time. So as an agenda item, the chair um, will not be in jeopardy of committing an OML complaint by not answering the question. This is, this is public comment, not public participation. Traditionally, the chair has responded to questions that tend to, uh, and the trend of not answering questions started around five years ago. Is there a chance to reconsider this practice? 
Can you see the problem? The fact that the school committee uh, won't answer questions, doesn't comply with public records law, nor do they give straight answers and email responses, which begs the question, what's the point of having these meetings? All right, two, revolutions occur in, um, often occur extraordinary loss of life, property, uh, opportunity and culture. How deeply has the committee considered the impact of revolution on members of our diverse community and the definition which it has historically provided? Any? Okay. Three, according to our research this year, uh, is the first time the town of Acton failed to officially celebrate Patriots Day with the exception of cancellations due to the pandemic. How does this committee plan to rectify the misperceptions of Acton's role in the American Revolution? Um, we'd appreciate some answers at some point publicly. Thank you. Hi there, Rebecca Wilson, Wingate Lane. Good evening. Tonight I'd like to speak about the inherent problem with claiming that only the majority should decide on certain issues, in this case, the retirement of the school mascot. The idea of tyranny of the majority is attributed to the ancient Greeks and was of real concern to the founders of our country. The founders hoped that a system of checks and balances, the Bill of Rights, and localized control would be enough to counteract this problem. Unfortunately, we see, even locally, how this problem can persist. This tyranny demands continual resistance. Popular opinion is not the best way to make decisions, especially when it comes to a minority experiencing harm. The majority will naturally vote for what benefits them and the minority are oppressed. It is a fatal flaw in democracy, one which can be alleviated, but only if there is the will to do so. We do not have a marketplace of ideas where our worst impulses are naturally excluded. Let's not forget some other popular opinions. Slavery, manifest destiny, fear of Japanese Americans during World War II, and opposing the Equal Rights Amendment. So no, the, major the argument that a majority of the entire town must be in agreement for a mascot retirement is a faulty one, and thinly veiled bigotry at that. It is ridiculous to assert that alumni who no longer live in Acton or Boxborough should have a say in this, and that people who are new community members should not. It should matter to every single adult in this town that some students, no matter how small a number, felt uncomfortable with colonial representation. The fact that it doesn't is deeply, deeply troubling. We must listen to minority voices, challenge our own internal biases, and stand up when we see a trampling of others' rights. Remember, be kind, Acton. Michael Bialis, Willow Street. Uh, first of all, I want to say I wasn't thrilled with the name at first. It was a Boston team. But I was thrilled when I read this statement because the thought behind it and the spirit behind it that the students came up with Made, it, made me go change from saying, okay, that's an okay name, and, and there's a Boston team, to say, this really means something to these students. And it really has potential for the spirit of the school and the direction of the school. Um, I do want to reiterate the point that, that people who uh, are saying save our colonials, that their colonials don't need saving. As was said, their achievements, their spirit, their, uh, on the sports fields and theater and other places will always be there and their connection will always be there. So it's not a question, your colonials are saved, they will be remembered. But now it's time for something, for a symbol that all the students can connect with. I also, uh, want to say that people who feel that the uh, changing of the name disrespects Ivis Davis, Isaac Davis and his compatriots should remember that it was the loyalists who wanted to stay colonials. Isaac Davis died trying to throw off the name of being a colonial. Thank you. Lucia Maricela, Deepa Road in Boxburg. On October 15th, 2020, our school committee hastily decided to retire our colonial mascot. In response, we created a counter petition and began emailing the committee with our input in hopes that they would change their mind. We spent a year and a half fighting to get it back. Many community members requested an appeal process. We hope you cared about the people's opinion enough to put your own personal agendas aside and allow a new process and make a wrong right. But you didn't. Instead, you appointed a mascot screening subcommittee to create a process to rename the mascot. At this time, I voted to reinstate the colonial as I felt there were no better name for our mascot. 
but my vote was cast out with all the other colonial votes. The results of the survey proved that the people wanted colonial more than any other option. Many people in the town didn't want the change and respected our town heritage. Now we, the ones who didn't want the change, may have the burden of a costly project to change our logo on uniforms, gym floors, fields, and scoreboards. You said that it would cost 250000 for uniforms alone, and you would replace as needed. You also told us that all the costs associated with the mascot change would be covered by the school district budget. But did you take time to learn all the costs before the decision to retire the Colonial was made? We don't want to pay taxes for this, as this is not an improvement for our school. We also don't want the school to make cuts to be able to pay for this. Seems like a waste of money for a change that has created division and outrage in the community and school. When we came to you for support, after seeing our kids being bullied and silenced, certain committee and staff members mocked the Colonial and its supporters through private text messages, not realizing we'd have access to these public records later. Then you wasted money on legal fees to try to cover them up. So as money seems to be an issue here, it brings me to these questions, which I know aren't going to be answered, but I'm still going to ask them. Um, how much will the mascot change cost? And is the plan to have costs associated with this change to be covered by the school district? And how will this happen since we are already two million over budget? Thank you. Christine Marlowe, Boxborough, Massachusetts. Recently, you stated that you were over budget by $2 million. But not to worry, you will try and get it through your petty fund. Now you are planning on replacing a mascot that most of the community and students don't want replaced. Oh, I know, I've heard your statement, but that statement has no value. The process was flawed and the start and, prob and probably <clears throat> illegal. To add to this, both Tessa and Peter had each received emails during this whole process asking them what the cost would be and is it fiscally irresponsible to be spending time and money on removing a mascot that could cost one million dollars or more. All this during a global pandemic where people were dying, losing their jobs, homes and businesses. Both said the cost would be net neutral, only 250,000 for new uniforms which would be replaced as they wore out. Except now, you are looking at a graphic designer to design the new logo. Why aren't our students good enough to do this job? Why are you once again spending money you don't have? Furthermore, if donations have been made for the Colonials, this school must ha may have to return donations if you discontinue the use of the Colonial mascot. We have three to five scoreboards that were donated. We have a brand new gym floor with a brand new Colonial logo on it that cost around $120,000. And the list goes on. Talk about privilege. You spend our hard-earned tax dollars like there's no tomorrow, while the residents of this community are trying to manage their own budgets because of inflation and rising costs. However, that's not the most upsetting position. You are laying off around 15 teacher's assistants when we need them now more than ever. Our students are struggling because of two years of remote learning. You, One minute remaining. You as the school committee and administration have a fiduciary responsibility to us, the taxpayers. You are supposed to spend our tax dollars wisely, not throw it away on a mascot that most of the community did not want. I say no, one penny of our tax dollars should go to this new mascot or any fees associated with this project. How do you justify these decisions to this community? Where are you getting the funds to fund this new mascot? And why are you laying off 15 teacher's assistants when they are needed now more than ever? Can you answer any of those questions? Anybody? You stood here and talked about the teachers and how stressed out they are. You're taking away the, the assistance and you won't, and you're gonna spend money on a mascot that most of the community didn't want and the revolution compared to the colonial and Thank because you. our Your history class doesn't teach the right information. Please hold your applause. Excuse me, please hold your applause. No applause. Thank you. If the community cannot maintain a respectful decorum in the meeting, we'll cease the public participation. 
Uh, thank you. Fred Smith, Nylander Way, parent of three AB students. I'd like to thank the school committee for appropriately responding to the wishes of the students and the, who overwhelmingly and rightfully supported the retirement of the old mascot. The process was well run. We were quiet when you talked. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, the process was well run, and I feel like the final decision was made with appropriate input of the community, students, parents, and staff. I want to echo what was said, said earlier, that the, revolution, the motivation for the new name speaks volume to the spirit and the hope of our student body. Well done. It's clear that a small but vocal right-wing contingent of Acton residents are upset about the changes. On more than one occasion, I've wondered, how could a bunch of adults with no kids in the schools be so upset about changing a high school mascot? But of course, like the protests by the alt-right in Charlottesville were not about the statues, the com complaints by the right-wing members of the Acton community have not been about a mascot. Thank you for standing up against white supremacy and racism in our community. Good evening, my name is Bill Doucette. I have a child currently attending an AB school and I'd like to speak in favor of changing the name of the mascot. Prior to moving to Acton six years ago, my family lived in another school district in Massachusetts with a mascot with a problematic name. Although that town had won many sports championships over decades with the old mascot name, the issue was resolved and a new name was chosen within a year. This was about 10 years ago, and I hope Acton can follow through with this proposed change in a year-long time frame like this other town. I've heard the issue of money being raised tonight. Um, I just want to point out that there are many things in our school, schools. That we have a high school pool, we have an arts program, we have fitness equipment that not all the community members benefit from. Um, so there are things that we have to think outside the box, so to speak. Um, I'm sure that there will be many students who will have a greater sense of pride in this town and our school district as a result of the change of the mascot. And finally, on a personal, interpersonal level, I just want to say one of the man, many aspects of Acton that I find most appealing um, is that our residents and many of the people I've met here have families with roots and cultures that are different from mine. Um, listening to their voices and, and people who grew up outside the United States or had family members who did, I hear, understand, and respect their interpretation of the title colonial. If Acton and Boxborough really aspire to be a welcoming community, we need to focus and need to listen to the voices of all our residents and not simply focus on those who have lived here the longest. I urge the school committee to approve the name change and I thank you for your time. Uh, you guys don't know my name, but I graduated AB in 2018. And even though you don't know my name, I've been called a racist, I've been called a bigot, and a slew of other demeaning labels. And now apparently, as an alumni, my opinion doesn't matter. But I'd like to tell you what I think of you guys, since you guys get to tell me what you think of me without even knowing me. And I've heard quite a bit about you guys. I see a bunch of people sitting up here with a closed mind, hiding behind power, not listening to the student body. And while that sits in, I'd like to tell you a story about a big member of this community. His name was Coach Amanda Leah. And if you don't know who that is, then that already shows your disconnect with the community. He's known by everyone, the students, the teachers, as a mentor, a teacher, a friend. And when I was on the freshman soccer team, he was our coach. And every day we went out there and we talked about Isaac Davis. And yeah, I heard the point about Isaac Davis. But it wasn't about Isaac Davis that he talked to us about. It was about the spirit of standing up against people trying to take away your freedoms and your liberties. That's always what the Colonials have been about. And, you know, you guys want to change the name, and I'm sure I'm not going to convince you otherwise, but I'll say this much. You cannot call people, students, who have gone through the school and felt that pride and felt that sense of, I'm a B, I'm a colonial, and you cannot tell them that they are racist without knowing them, and that they're bigoted without knowing them. That's wrong. And it's only people who don't listen to the student body, who sit in a little echo chamber and laugh amongst each other, 
while not understanding the actual damage that they're doing to the community and to the students. Thank you. Hello, good evening, Steve Ballard from Boxborough again. I wanna thank the uh, committee here, uh, the school administration, um, the committee of the students, and everyone who's been involved in persevering over these last few years to get to this point. And I'm really happy to hear that, that both the uh, subcommittee uh, here uh, for the naming of the new mascot and the student committee were unanimous in this choice. And I love this choice myself, but it's not in my opinion, shouldn't matter, and nor should these others. I, my son was also on the freshman soccer team. I'm not sure if that was his judge, uh, his, his, his coach. Uh, I can't remember now, but he, he was on track the next several years, back in 2009 or 10, uh, when he was in the ninth grade. And he supports, and I've got tons of photos of him in colonial uniforms for track and cross country and the freshman soccer. and. Um, you know, I don't want to speak for him either. It's not his decision. It's the decision of those who have made this. And I think we should look at this, um, you know, this choice of revolution as not just, uh, you know, a change of the mascot in reaction to legitimate concerns, which they are, uh, uh, that some have. Um, it is that. But it's more. I think it's, we're lucky this, this uh, particular choice, I believe, is an innovative improvement um, you know, and, and refinement of the concept to the extent it was good behind the old mascot. And, and for that reason, also because it's cool, I, I think this is great. And, um, uh, you know, and we heard, uh, you know, I think we heard the junior high and se um, senior high principals talk about school improvement plans. Well, this is, a, this is an improvement plan. Um, that came from some individuals, the students, even if it's not, you know, we don't know exactly how many people would favor the, the colonials. Thank you. It, it's a great thing. So um, thank you all. Bye. Thank you again. My name is Madeline. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are inevitable changes happening all over our world. Continuously pushing for a past mascot that doesn't equally represent all of us in, as a town is indignifying and quite frankly an embarrassment. Some of you called people like me against the past colonial mascot as living in a bubble. Wow, what an irrational, ignorant thought. No, we do not live in a bubble. We live in the reality. The past mascot doesn't equally represent all of us as a town. Please stop the hate. Accept the new mascot as a positive change for all. Instead, how about we start talking and finding solutions to some of the real issues we have affecting our schools and town, like bullying. Um, as my daughter, who's seven years old and attends Douglas, she gets bullied. Um, swastikas written in elementary school bathrooms, drugs, and alcohol. Or how this past Monday, it was a half day, and I had about 25 students who went over to Yankee Village where I live, which I really don't have a problem with, but it was what they were doing. They went and they built a teepee. Beautiful job done. Now they're building a second one. Problem is, while they were building the second teepee, they were war whooping. That is indignifying, it's disrespectful, it's humiliating. And that is what the town adults need to be teaching the kids. Positivity, not ignorance, not hate, acceptance, acceptance of all of us. It's time to reflect on real issues and stop being ignorant and keep talking about something that is not going to change any longer. Colonials, do not represent me because I'm brown, yet I am half African and I am proudly half European with Spanish, Portuguese, Indian, Egyptian, you name it, it's in my DNA. However, I do myself know what the colonials did to people in this country. Can we stop with the hate and just move on and start talking about and finding solution for the real issues? Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Jim Carey, 11 Gosford Road. Uh, where I live, the Minutemen marched by my house about two weeks ago on their way down to uh, Old North Bridge. 
And the night before, I went over to the Faulkner homestead to uh, listen to the colonials come and spread the alarm. But I think it's as easy for them to be the revolution spreading the alarm. I'm proud of living in Acton, excited that we have this history, but also excited that you, took, you had the courage here to retire the colonial name, which is, at best, uh, problematic in today's understanding of colonialism. Uh, and I'm really excited about the AB Revolution name. I think it's a great name. And I got a chance to look at the worksheet and the voting tallies and the information that came out. It's overwhelmingly supported. I, so thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Mazzioli. And as I told you, I've lived in this town my whole life. I went to school here. Um, I sent my kids to school here. and. I have, in my whole life, never, ever, ever felt like everybody is so against each other in this town, ever. And the colonials, they represented everybody. There wasn't uh, somebody that, you know, somebody feels a certain way or does a certain thing. Well, there were people that felt the colonials should, should stay. The people that, you know, I graduated, he graduated, why weren't we considered? Was it a small group of kids that wanted the group change? Did everybody ask? Because I read articles that said, you got quite a few votes for the Colonials. And that the high school kids really didn't much care. They were sending you piggly wiggly names. This seems to be like a political move and it's causing division. You're talking about like equity and inclusion, like that's what the school is supposed to do. The school is supposed to teach our kids reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's what they're supposed to do, and not to, to pick on other kids, no matter what. So now you're like ramping up all of this division in some kind of masked way to try to prevent it. You know, and people, and you're making these people racist, and these people are, you know, minorities. Like, we were just a community before. And this has caused a lot of problems. And instead of talking about it and working it out, you're not answering questions, and people are feeling, you know, shunted and shamed. And, you know, you have a right to not like the name, you have a right to like the name, but you should want the community as a whole to feel like everybody is proud of you know, the kids that go to the school, that they can help each other out. It shouldn't be that we're asking questions and we have concerns and, you know, we're not getting feedback. And, and nobody should be, feel like that because you want to keep the name, you're trying to hurt somebody's feelings or exclude somebody. We had all kinds of kids in my school. And yes, kids were bullied and that should be addressed, but you, you can't, you know, force what you think or a political agenda down these kids' throats at all. I, I nannied for two, three, two little girls, two little white girls when I was younger. And they went to school every day. There was a, a black kid in their neighborhood. And they all played and talked and got on the bus. And one day, I was with them for two years. They got off the bus. After Martin Luther, they had learned about Martin Luther King in school. And they said to me, hey, Kim, did you know that so-and-so was black? The time is up. Thank you. Before they were taught in school that there was a difference, they didn't realize. I just want to say thank you very much for, to the school committee and Superintendent Light. Thank you for helping making our community better. Thank you for the thoughtful process and consideration you have given the naming of the school mascot. Thank you for acknowledging all points of view and acknowledging our changing demographics and community and also acknowledging our town's rich history. And thank you for your service. Anthony Bellissimo, Parker Street. Uh, I'm the parent of two current AB students. Um, uh, I want to echo what uh, the previous speaker said. Um, thank you, the committee. I happen to like the name a lot. Um, that's not really the point. Um, I, I would like to generally remind people that it is not the case that the status quo must necessarily 
remain in place as long as no one wants to, as long as anyone wants to not change it. Um, I am pleased that the students were at the center of the process. Um, it seems like they had good guidance. Um, it seems like uh, th there was some back and forth, which is also good. Um, I think that Thanks. Hi, Julia Day at Nagog Hill Road. I'm here to speak in support. I want to say thank you so much for this process, which really centered the students. And thank you also for allowing this opportunity for community members to speak. I feel like I learned a lot today from being able to listen and participate. And I feel like there's a lot of hope for our community, even through this process, which obviously has brought up a lot of feelings for a lot of people, you know, listening to Joni and her goals for the high school, talking about how she wanted to make sure that students were centered. I think that this process has really modeled that. I also want to say, you know, I heard earlier one of the speakers talking about, do we feel like our town even recognizes our role in the American Revolution? That's in the name, revolution. It's really kind of amazing. Um, you know, also I heard speakers talking about Let's see, I might be planking on a couple of things. But um, I just want to say I really appreciate all of this, all of the work that went into this, all of everyone's commentary today. And I think we're doing a lot of really important modeling for our kids on how to go through a difficult process. So I should also say I'm a parent of future AB students, <laughs> two-year-old and a four-year-old. So Thanks again. Um, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Lovensky Jasmine uh, from Bugsboro. And I want to just say thank you to you, uh, the school committee members. <clears throat> it's very difficult for people who are just sitting, you know, behind or not being in your position to cri criticize you. It is a very difficult position. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of division in, in, in the community. And you did your best to bring everybody together. And I want to challenge you all to listen to both groups. Continue to listen to them. And I've seen you, 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 you you've done that before. Continue to listen to them. And um, those who are against the retire, retiring of the mascot, it is time for change. It's time for change. Even, even if you want it or not, change is coming. So get ready for it. So now we are inviting you to come together. Let's do the change together. Don't stay away and try you know, to um, manipulate something and try to say, oh, change, you don't want that. It is, I understand it, it's difficult because you've been in the school for many years and um, it is very important to you. And, uh, but yes, the school committee, I want to thank you again for this. You accepted to listen to those who are quiet in the community. Those who are silent in the community. It is very difficult to listen to silent voices. So continue to do that. And a lot of people are you know, loud as well, listen to them. You will listen to them anyway, because they are loud. But listen to the minority people. Thank you. OK. Uh, a couple comments again. Uh, we are going to be taking community feedback on this uh, recommendation over the next two weeks. And we'll be making uh, another opportunity for the committee to deliberate and to vote at our May 19th meeting. Uh, and I also want to encourage members of the community who were here who had questions for us, please send those to us via email. It's not that we don't want to answer the questions, it's just that this is a difficult forum with which to be prepared with those answers. So please email them to us. Superintendent and I will do our best to answer as many of them as possible. Budget. 
Yes. Peter, would you mind clarifying okay. a little bit about that? <laughs> Sorry, what I asked Adam was, um, I heard several people you know, express a comment concerned about the budget impact of this. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, you know, we are not carrying money uh, that was beyond what we traditionally carry in our operating budget for this. Um, we do know that, you know, annually the athletic director is looking to replace uniforms because athletic uniforms become worn out with use. And so we think that there's a natural cycle that we can follow for this. So, you know, I, I just want to make that point. There are certainly capital changes and improvements that we continue to make and we'll evaluate those over time um, as we do this. But um, I, I just want to make sure that one piece is, is clarified for everyone. Are you going to have to return donations? Thanks, Peter. If you change the name? Okay, we're going to move on. Again, questions, please send them directly to myself and the superintendent, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. We're going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the superintendent evaluation process reminder. Uh, so in your packet, there's a memo that uh, details the process for evaluating uh, the superintendent. Um, I'll just point out uh, attachment number one in that memo, which is our timeline. So at this meeting, we're giving you the reminder of the process. Uh, at our next meeting, the superintendent will give us a report on the status of the current year goals. And at that meeting, I'll also issue a general public request for input. The most important date on this timeline is June 2nd. June 2nd. I'm looking for eye contact from all the committee members so that they understand that June 2nd, it's before graduation, that is the date by which we need the committee and the public feedback back to the chair so that I have ample time to write my evaluation. For those in this room who've sat in this chair before me, no one told you that like you'll have to send like 35 emails to get that but by that date? I will, I will go from gentle reminder to nasty gram very quickly after June 2nd if I'm not getting input. Um, so Adam, just to clarify, it's June 2nd. Thank you, Ben. Gold star for the evening. Uh, June 2nd is the date by which members need to submit their completed written evaluations. Uh, and then we'll have a break June 9th. Um, the school committee will provide some input on the goals for the next year, and then on June 16th, the composite evaluation will be included in the addendum and presented at our meeting to be voted upon. We are still considering the fact, this is a good point, Tessa asks, I thought we didn't have to write one this year. This, this review is a formative evaluation, is not a summative evaluation because we have uh, opted to go on to a two-year cycle with the superintendent. However, this being the first time that we're doing a two-year cycle, we felt it would be best to try and keep to standard practices as much as possible. It's the most awkward part of his job. Uh, any questions about the evaluation? All submissions to be an iambic pentameter? Only for you, John. I, I, let me rephrase that. Should they be submitted in iambic pentameter, I will be contacting you to help me write the entire evaluation. Uh, all right. Any other questions about the superintendent evaluation? Can anybody tell me what date I need all of the, your materials back by? No. <laughs> awesome. I can. So. With that, I will move on to the next item, which is an EDCO update from Peter, please. This is a brief EDCO update, um, which should be a good sign for all of you. Um, I am pleased to report that EDCO um, is on track with all of its liabilities to close on schedule um, for June 30th of this year. Um, thank you for your support. Uh, we were able to have some conversations with Lexington. They've agreed to pay all of the costs associated with EDCO. Um, and we're moving forward toward closure. I want to also uh, give a big thanks to Lincoln Sudbury. Um, the school committee and administration there has agreed to take on retiree health plan management um, for in perpetuity, essentially. So um, that is a major undertaking. Uh, I want to thank them. I also want to thank our human resource department because they have agreed to uh, essentially maintain the EDCO website for the next 10 years and also all employee records. Um, so, you know, this was, a, this was really a team effort, but we are, you know, on schedule and, you know, where initial estimates were coming in, you know, possibly at a half a million dollars, um, you know, I think we're going to, you know, end up at around 100,000. 
So, and I, I actually anticipate we might get some money back at the end of this. So that's, you know, a, a reasonably positive outcome in a tragic situation. Any questions on the EDCO update for Peter? None. John. Um, I, I, I do think it, it really was important that, you know, obviously AB did its part, but um, if you want to send uh, an email to LS on behalf of the committee that we recognize, you know, their contribution and are very appreciative, I think that would be a good thing to do. Thank you. Okay, next item up uh, is discussion of the fair share amendment resolution. Um, this is an item that we're going to vote on as a committee, so I think what I'm going to suggest is that we take five minutes and wait for the entire committee to return back to the room. So. I'll, let it, I'll, I'll set it up while we wait for the missing members to return. Uh, so the um, ABEA uh, came to us and shared a resolution regarding the Fair Share Amendment. For those who aren't familiar, the Fair Share Amendment is a proposed change to the Massachusetts Constitution which allows for a 4% surtax on income above $1 million. Um, and could generate significant funds that could be directed towards both public education and public transportation in Massachusetts. So we have uh, in our packet and pending before us a resolution in support of that amendment. And like I said, I think it's a pretty important item and I would like the committee as a whole to be here when we vote on it. And I also know that Mike is probably here and would wish to speak to the committee possibly on that amendment, on, on that resolution. They're on their way. so. I've got nothing left to vamp with. I'm out of poems. OK. So we are uh, discussing the resolution in support of the Fair Share Amendment, which is in our packet. Um, and are there any questions or comments on that before I invite Mike to come speak? Mr. Belalescu. There we go. Thank you. Um, I have to say, I was kind of excited about the audience. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what happened, because I'm here to talk about politics. So I thought, I thought folks would be interested. But um, noting the time and seeing the visible yawns of the committee, which I recognize in my eighth grade students, I will be um, as brief as I can. Um, good evening. As Adam said, my name is Mike Balulescu. I'm an Acton resident, a Merriam parent, and president of the Acton Boxborough Education Association, our district's teachers union. I'm here right now on behalf of almost 500 educators in our association to ask for your support and your solidarity. The Massachusetts Teachers Association, of which the ABEA is a part, is currently working across the state to generate support for the Fair Share Amendment, which will be on the ballot this November. The MTA and the ABEA are part of a grassroots effort to bring together educators, parents, students, activists, and elected leaders towards the common cause of funding public education in Massachusetts. Tonight, I'm hopeful that you will pass a resolution, which you can find on page 13 in your packet, in support of that effort. The Fair Share Amendment has a very simple and important goal. Amend our state's constitution to allow the legislature to raise income taxes on those in the state that can most afford it. In order to generate $2 billion annually to fund education and transportation needs in the Commonwealth. Though we should all be proud of our current financial commitment to public education in Massachusetts, there is still more work to be done. The Fair Share Amendment will provide badly needed resources to our teachers and administrators across the state at a time when student needs are greater than ever before. I know that this committee has felt personally the challenges of appropriately funding public education here in Acton and Boxborough. I know that this committee also understands the dire need for funding in other districts across our region and across Massachusetts. You represent a broad and diverse constituency with broad views and diverse views on fiscal matters. 
Nevertheless, I hope you will take advantage of this opportunity tonight to join our growing movement and voice support for a fair taxation system in Massachusetts that asks those who have been blessed the most to take on a little more responsibility in meeting the needs of our students. Thank you so much for considering this resolution tonight, and I hope your vote will be unanimous and enthusiastic. I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Any questions for Mike? I'll just express a word of gratitude, Mike, for both waiting patiently for your turn and, unlike the secondary school leadership, meeting the three-minute timer that was associated with your I, I'm, I want to say for the record for John Peterson's benefit that I am an Eagle Scout, and therefore, if nothing else, John, prepared. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please, go ahead, Jenny. I, I'd like to thank you for your advocacy on this issue. I am an enthusiastic supporter, personally, of this. Um, the Commonwealth have been starving our public education at, at both the K-12 level and at the, uh, at, and at the college level for almost two decades now um, and it's inexcusable and something needs to be done and I think that this would um, be an excellent start at, um, at starting to fill the, the gap that's been left year after year. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Just real quickly and not to split hairs with Ginny, but the, the Commonwealth has begun to address public funding of education through the Student Opportunity Act, which is three years old. Before that, the Foundation Budget Review Commission, of which I was a member, their report is six and a half years old. To, to Mike's point of what this money, what this bill would do, what this amendment would do, you could ask the question, well, what, what do we need the money for? We need the money for education? We've got the SOA. I just want to remind people, because this is something that just with every year that goes by gets buried, one of the major issues that the Foundation Budget Review Commission report addressed in words, but not, it didn't re, it, it get uh, memorialized into action in the SOA, was the burgeoning cost of in-district special education. It cited it as a billion dollars then, six and a half years ago. It's not been addressed in the SOA, and that is one significant piece. We, you look at our own district. Our out-of-district costs have trended downward in the last few years, but our in-district cost of special ed has gone up because we're providing, we're able to provide more, more programs within the district. This is what could be addressed with the funds available in this, in this bill. So I appreciate, as a, as a commission member many years ago, I appreciate the, the union getting behind this measure. The state seems pretty flush now, so there's going to be a, oh, what do we need the money for? This is what we could use the money for. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Go ahead, David. So I, I'm fully in support of this, but I just wanted, to, I've been mentioning this to a few people and I just wanted to mention it to the, the whole committee. In addition, um, the funding formula needs to change for our district to be w well funded. You know, we're an affluent community, but we also have many school children, which offsets the affluentness, right? So the, um, um, I, I, did, I had some months back, I had done some uh, uh, division um, uh, to try to uh, compare us with other communities in the Commonwealth. I didn't do it for all the communities in the Commonwealth, but uh, we have a, you know, in Acton, roughly 20% um, of our population is school age. In Boxborough, 15, 16% of the population is school age, that, which means, you know, uh, for that each taxpayer has to fund um, a large percent of, percentage of a, of a student, right? Much more than other communities, M uh, much more. Those numbers are very high across the Commonwealth. They were the highest that I found. I didn't do, again, an exhaustive search. Uh, by way of comparison, Boston is 6%. Um, and so, and we're 20-ish and 15-ish. So, um, uh, th the, you know, the, this change for additional monies is, is excellent, but also the funding formula needs to change, and we need to, um, you know, I've talked with our legislators about this, but we need to continue to do that. Thank you. 
Go ahead, John. And then we're moving on. Well, if, if I had been better prepared, I would have sent a note to Peter that said that we should have included in the packet the text of the legislation. So I want to read the first sentence just so people understand exactly what the amendment says. The amendment says, uh, to provide the resources for quality public education and affordable public colleges and universities and for the repair and maintenance of roads, bridges, and public transportation. All revenues received in accordance with this paragraph shall be expended subject to appropriation only for these purposes. So to be clear, um, there's flexibility in the allocation of these funds between those purposes. So I'm a fan of both of those purposes, but it would be not correct to think that you know this change benefits solely education and that there aren't some politics down the road uh, governing what, what, what would happen. Um, the second comment that I would make is um, you know, I'm a huge fan of a, a more progressive taxation system and since this has that element to it, um, I do appreciate it. But um, the sad thing to note is that uh, as much as uh, we love all of our services and I can't imagine living in a state that didn't provide services like Massachusetts does, um, we are ultimately in competition with other states. So pe people need to be a little bit careful about what the total tax burden looks like compared to everything else. As a value, I think the Commonwealth continues to be an outstanding place to live, but not everybody necessarily feels the same way. So I'm going to vote enthusiastically in support of this, but I just want to remind everybody it's a little bit complicated. Thank you. All right, is there a motion that it be resolved that the Acton-Boxborough Regional School Committee, in partnership with the Acton-Boxborough Education Association, supports the fair share amendment and endorses its packet? Passage. So, so moved. Seconded. All right, so I'll give that to Jenny. Uh, and Ben seconded that. So, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And Mike, since you're standing right there, on behalf of all the educators, please accept our thanks for all that you and every other teacher and staff member in the district are doing. So thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to subcommittee and member reports. For his last update on the Health Insurance Trust, I'll look to John Peterson. The Acton Health Insurance Trust met last Thursday. Cook & Company presented the cash flow showing a year-to-date loss of $0.96 million uh, with three months remaining in the fiscal year. The uh, projected loss for FY22 is about $1.3 million. That's uh, about $0.3 million higher than the projected $1 million loss, which is used as the basis of the rate setting process. Uh, the Treasurer's report through nine months was consistent with the reported cash flow. Uh, Tim Harrison reviewed his proposed contract for Treasury services for the next three years. The trust agreed to sign the contract, which allows the trust to opt out after the first year. Uh, trustees also approved uh, the RFP for stop loss insurance at levels of 150, 175, and $200,000. The next and final meeting of the trust for the year will be June 16th. Thank you, John. And at this time, I will mention that we are appointing Andrew as our new representative to the Health Insurance Trust. Thank you, Andrew. And John, why don't you go ahead and give us the capital improvement update as well? <laughs> um, on the capital improvement front, um, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago to go through the um, capital improvement website, you know, which continues to be a good source of information about how projects are progressing. Um, we talked again about the Doran Whittier, you know, 13-year plan. Um, so an important thing that's going to go on this next year is we're going to refresh that plan, um, and but we'll do that not as the original plan was constructed with an ar architect sort of eye, but we'll do it in a much more operational way. So I think JD felt like. We learned a lot through the door and Whittier process, but we wanted to do something uh, differently. We also talked about the fact that um, the capital sub next year will need to spend a significant effort um, with respect to Conant, to, you know, so that we can build towards an SOI um, that's the SOI that really we really want in case MSBA actually does um, approve it. We talked about. Um, general you know, electrification efforts on campus and different things that are going on. And I think um, one of the things that JD is going to try and do with the website is, again, change things a little bit so it's more clear the role that grants are playing 
um, in some of our capital projects, which have been particularly important with respect to these energy activities. Um, and the last thing that we noted, just because it is something that I know will come before the committee again, is that we still need a way to pay for the upgrade to the uh, phone system on the central cap campus. Uh, I'll just add to that, because we did receive a concern. Um, I, I forget the name of the commission in Massachusetts, but they essentially are the organization that oversees the new E911 regulations um, that, you know, they noted Blanchard was out of compliance, um, you know, due to a concern that had been sent to them. Um, we responded that we have a planned repair you know, at Blanchard to the telephone system um, this summer, which satisfies, you know, any concerns. However, we really need to replace our phone system because it's it's not E911 compliant, um, and that's going to be really important that we do shift money within the capital plan and make sure that that gets done within the next two to three years. We would expedite that, but in all honesty, it's such a project for the tech department to be able to do that. It actually has to be managed over several years. One of the reasons we're deciding to kick it off right now is that um, we have the new school coming online, and with that, we could actually build the infrastructure for the new phone system for the district into the new school and part of that building project budget, and then we can build out the rest of the schools around that. So, But I, I just want to put it on the radar that it's really critical that that continues to happen and that we, we follow a, a path to get that done within two to three years. Thank you. Any questions for John about health insurance trust or capital improvements? Thanks, John. Budget, Kira. Hi. Budget sub met last Monday, April 25th, to prepare, uh, review, and critique the draft town meeting slides. Robust discussion resulted in significant changes. Mm. Um, between the first draft and the second, with more iterations to come during the week as we finish things up. I'd like to extend my thanks to every member of the subcommittee, each providing something to the slides. I'd like to also give a shout out to Peter, Marie, Dave, Andrew Shen, Don Bentley, and J.D. Head, who provided supplemental information with quick turnarounds so that the slides could be accurate and delivered on time. The slides are in your packet. Adam and John will deliver our presentations this year. Thank you, gentlemen, in advance. Um, budget sub will likely meet one more time before the end of the school year, date and time to be determined. Do you want me to do acting yes, leadership? Please. Okay. Acting leadership group met last Thursday, April 28th, to discuss the budget projections to be published in the town meeting warrant and to lay the groundwork for FY24 budget process. The spreadsheet now shows more realistic projections for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, though I would caution that much is still unsettled and likely all of the numbers will change. For our work as a committee, there are two items of particular note. First, the spreadsheet does at least reflect the carryover of budget stressors that drove our process for FY23. Other factors will likely be determined by the outcome of our upcoming contract negotiations. These must and will be addressed during budget subs meetings next year. Second, the impact of Minuteman's assessment on the town's budget is more evident in the spreadsheet. I invite y'all to take a look at this year's number for FY23 and the projected assessments for FY24 and 25. I suspect that this is something we might want to take a look at in subcommittee and as a full committee in the next school year. ALG will reconvene sometime this summer or early fall. Thank you, Kira. Any questions about budget, sub, or ALG. Seeing none, uh, I will report on the facilities renaming uh, committee. So in addition to both Amy and Ben serving from the school committee, the district has appointed J.D. Head and Steve Martin to the pool renaming committee. We'll work with those individual individuals to set up a first meeting and recruit a community member to get that process started. Moving on to the consent agenda. Go ahead. Um, yeah, is there a plan, um, I guess, to include any swimmers um, on this committee, just seeing as they had a lot of input or a lot of experience in the pool and whatnot? Mr. Benson, again, we'll, we'll gladly answer questions that are emailed to us. I will just share that uh, you might remember that 
Mr. Blumenthal, who is serving on that committee, actually shared that he was a former swimmer. So we, we will. But again, questions, please send them to us via email. Happy to take your comments, though. Uh, I was just referring to Acton swimmers. But again, traditionally, we've answered questions in meetings. Um, if, if I may indulge, Mr. Klein, or Mr. Chairman, briefly, please. Um, Mr. Benson, I swam for Weston High School from 1989 to 1993. I served on the Dual County League, which is the same league for which Acton Boxborough swims on. I feel that I should be able to represent swimmers within the DCL and the AB schools, even though I did swim for Weston. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I was wondering, could I ask Mr. Light a quick follow-up to one of his questions about the budget and whether... and. Uh, it's, it's pretty late. Again, please, I, I'm, I'm happy to have the questions answered for you, but like I've said no, numerous times, send them to myself and the superintendent and we will answer them. Okay, I just think a lot of people want to know, um, are any parts of the, uh, um, sorry, I'm blanking on it, and the reserve funds being used to cover the exorbitant cost of the mascot? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our consent agenda. So items on the consent agenda do not usually require discussion and are approved with one vote unless any member would like to hold an item for discussion and a separate vote. I'll read each item by name and if any member would like it held, please say hold. Item number one, approval of the ABRSC meeting minutes of April 7, 2022. Item two, recommendation to approve donation from the Conan PTO in the amount of $2,400. And item three, a recommendation to approve a $1,800 anonymous donation for all day kindergarten tuition assistance. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I moved. Seconded. That was Tessa, seconded by Ben. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That, has moved, that is uh, unanimous with gratitude. Final statement of warrants and recommendation to approve. If everyone's approved the warrants, the motion language is found in Dave's memo. Who would like to read that motion this evening? John, your last opportunity. Let me bring us home. I move that the school committee vote to approve payroll warrants as follows. Number P2221, dated 4-7-2022, in the amount of $2,827,052.52. Number P2222, dated 421-2022, in the amount of $2,799,889.45. Payroll deduction warrants as follows. Number 22-021PR, dated 4-7-2022, in the amount of $566,135.21. Number 22-022PR, dated 421-2022, in the amount of $1,159,640.43. Fender warrants as follows, number 22-021 dated 4-14-2022 in the amount of $2,161,216.44. Number 22-021A dated 4-14-2022 in the amount of $1,825.73. Number 22-022 dated 4-28-2022 in the amount of $632,000.07. There's a lot of 22s in there. Student activity warrants as follows, number 22 dash 021 BL dated 414 2022 in the amount of seven hundred and fifty dollars. Number twenty-two dash O twenty two BL dated four twenty-eight twenty twenty-two in the amount of three thousand eight hundred and forty-one dollars and thirteen cents. Number twenty-two dash O two two SH dated four twenty-eight twenty twenty-two in the amount of thirty-three thousand one hundred and twenty-seven dollars and seventy-one cents. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? None. That is unanimous. Thank you. FYI. So you will see that our annual town meeting slides are in the FYI tonight. As a reminder, the Boxborough annual town meeting begins at 7 p.m. this Monday at the Blanchard Memorial School in Boxborough. And the Acton annual town meeting begins at 7 p.m. the following Monday, the 16th, in the high school auditorium. I strongly encourage you to attend both meetings as John and I will present our budget to the towns and I know we would both appreciate your support. With that, Peter, is there anything else in the FYI you would like to highlight? Yeah, I'd just like to highlight we have the Safer Homes, Safer Community Gun Buyback uh, program that um, is in the packet. We'd just like to, you know, if you spread the word on that, that was a great program last year. We want to continue that this year. Um, and it's not in your packet, but the Out of, dark, out of Darkness Walk uh, to prevent for suicide awareness is coming up on May 14th. Uh, I believe it kicks off at 9 a.m. 
uh, or 10 a.m. I, I forget, but uh, I know that information's out there, so that may be something you want to stop by if you're in town. Excellent. Thank you. With that, I'd like to express my gratitude to the committee for staying with us for this meeting, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Seconded. That was moved by Kieran, seconded by Ben. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous. Thank you all. Good night.